Welcome. Good afternoon. Glad to see so many people here uh, on our uh, summit on policing. Um, really excited that the AUMA and the RMA together on this. This is a really good thing. Um, please note that the event is open to the news media. And so before we get started, we're just going to give everybody the quick Zoom refresher again. So for this session, um, only the presenters are going to be able to use their mics and cameras. And that's just makes it a lot easier to moderate as well, saves everybody some bandwidth. Now, there's lots of ways for you to participate, of course, um, engaging with everybody else that's on the call and there are over 600 people registered. So there's gonna be lots of people here. We are gonna be taking uh, questions throughout the session. So there's at the bottom of your screen is the Q&A button. And that's where you ask uh, your questions for the panelists or the presenters or any other questions you wanna make sure you get answered. Uh, and we'll get to as many of those as we have, can during the live part of it. And we will certainly endeavor to answer them all uh, afterwards, the ones we miss. Now, there's also the chat box, which uh, hopefully most of you are familiar with. You can post comments and chat with others on the session, but it's not for posting questions. So if you want the panelists to ask you a question, go to the Q&A. If you just wanna engage and make comments, uh, you certainly can do that through the chat. Now, on the button that you need to know about is especially important if you're trying to com com uh, sorry, communicate with everybody else. At the bottom, it says two on that little gray button. It says all panelists and attendees. That's if you want everybody to hear uh, the chat or, the met or whatever you're putting in the chat. You can also just uh, submit it to just the panelists, which are the people that are running the, the uh, webinar today. Um, so last session we had here a couple of weeks ago, we had over 100 questions. So we try, we're going to try and answer as many as we can. But again, uh, try to get your questions in early and uh, we'll do what we can to get through them all. Um, we are going to share all the comments with the AUMA and RMA boards and our guest speakers so that they're all aware of the concerns and gaps and in information that you're expressing. So uh, we will be using the Zoom poll feature for you to ask for feedback on some key policing issues that are gonna come up today. A new box is gonna pop up in your screen and you'll be asked to pick one or more responses. We'll give you a little bit of time to do that. And so we're gonna do a quick test question. And if our uh, game host can pop up our poll question. So the question is, are you as big a fan of Taylor Swift is Andrew Knack, who is the counselor from Edmonton and our VP of cities. And your responses are, yes, I have a Taylor tattoo. Yes, I like her music, but wouldn't play it at a work event. Nah, there's better music out there. No, I think her music is shallow and annoying. And nope, I'm pretty sure Taylor Swift makes up most of the soundtrack in hell. Please pick one, submit, and then we will show you those results. There are gonna be questions that come up that aren't multiple choice, uh, I believe. And then we'll ask you to enter the comments in the chat box. Um, and remember, you can use that chat at any time, but questions for the presenters must go to the Q&A. And on a lighter note, we are gonna have some lighthearted uh, trivia, although I think some of them are pretty heavy policing things, but anyway, um, we are gonna have some trivia and um, we are gonna have a prize to give away at the end of all this. So it looks like our poll was a kind of a tie between yeah and meh. Yeah, so uh, there we go. That's as simple as the polling works. And so now I am going to turn it over to our trivia master, which is Kara Westerland from the RMA. Take it away, Kara. Oh, Kara, I think you're muted. Or your speaker's not working. No. Oh, no, we can't hear you. Uh oh. So Carrie, you keep trying to talk. And how about if keep I trying. just there, there we are. go. Can we know? Yep. There we uh, go. All right. Well, hi everybody. I'm uh, Kara Westerland. I am vice president for RMA as well as a counselor from Brazoo County. I'll be quizzing you all today on your knowledge of police trivia. Don't worry. If you haven't studied, the trivia is just for fun. But as as a thank you for taking the time to join us today, all of the municipal representatives who are registered for the session have been entered into a draw to win this amazing gift basket full of local Alberta products. However, there is a catch. To claim your prize, you will have to be online 
and most importantly, still awake at the end of the session when we do the draw. When oh, we will then arrange to have the gift basket delivered to the lucky winner. If everybody's ready to go, we can start with the first two trivia questions. So topic number one is capital punishment. Robert Raymond Cook, the last man to die by capital punishment in Alberta, protested his innocence in the deaths of seven members of his own family until the day he went to the gallows in 1960. In what community did the killing of Cook's family take place? A, Pinoca, B, Camro, C, Innisfail, D, Stetler. All right, we're just waiting for the results to come in. The answer is A. Oh, sorry, I'm back up, wrong question. The answer was D, Stetler. Cook left his eyes to the Edmonton Eye Bank and donated his body to the University of Alberta Hospital for Medical Research. To this day, the good people of Stetler wonder about Cook's innocent and have Many have wondered uh, alternative theories about what had happened. A retired Red Deer lawyer is re-examining the case and hopes to produce a podcast on her findings. All right, next question. Florence Lazrendro was hanged at the Fort Saskatchewan jail on May 22nd, 1923. The only woman ever executed in Alberta. What crime did she commit? A, killed a police constable, D or B, kidnapped and killed her husband's mistress, C, killed and dismembered her husband, or D, killed her sister-in-law over stealing a recipe. All right, we're just waiting for the results. All right. So the answer was A, convicted of murder of Alberta Provincial Police Constable Stephen Lawson. Lazandro was sentenced to death with her co-accused, female, I'm, oh, I'm going to take a shot at the last name, Picariolo. Uh, other Alberta women had their sentences commuted to life in prison. Original court documents are available on the Provincial Archives website. All right, I'm going to hand things over to Paul for to get the next session started. Thanks very much, Kara. Uh, I wanna thank all those folks that uh, in the first trivia question voted for Pinoca as the Riva Pinoca County, uh, I do appreciate that. Uh, I'm Paul McLaughlin, glad to be here, president of the Rural Municipalities of Alberta. Thank you so much for all the folks that put the time and energy into this. I think we got a fantastic session today for you folks. Uh, we have 400 plus participants a great lineup of speakers. So I think we'll get lots done today and do appreciate all the time and effort put into this. So today's session is dedicated to discussing the feasibility of a provincial police service. And we have some great speakers lined up. First, we are pleased that the Minister of Justice and Solicitor General could join us today to an open session and talk about the priority issues he's working on. After the minister's remarks, we'll also hear from Doug Morgan, who is, the lead, is leading the Alberta Provincial Police Transition Study. And next, Deputy Minister Curtis Ablocki, Commanding Officer of the Alberta RCMP. We'll talk about the current state of the provincial policing in Alberta and the RCMP's plans for future directions. Then Brian Sov, President of the National Police Federation, will share the results of a recent poll of Albertans and their perceptions of the RCMP. And just to let you know, we built in time for questions after each guest speaker's presentation, and we'll be using the Q&A session for those questions. Last, AUMA and RMA will share the information on the Provincial Police Force Services in Ontario and Quebec, as well as the experience of municipalities that have considered transitioning away from RCMP. At the end of the session, after you've all heard from everybody, we'll be asking you to share your own thoughts on a Provincial Police Service using the Zoom polls feature as well. RMA and AUMA will use this feedback to help us develop our policy positions and advocacy on this topic. And again, just a reminder, and this is a reminder for me, 
that this session is open to the media. So please consider that too as well. So thank you very, very much. So we'll move on to our first guest speaker. Just bear with me. I'm pleased to introduce the Honorable Casey Madhu. Minister Madhu has attended a number of AUMA and RMA events in the past as Minister of Municipal Affairs, and we are pleased to have him here today as Minister of Justice and Solicitor General. Minister Madhu is also the MLA for Edmonton Southwest. He was born and raised in Nigeria, where he attended the University of Lagos and graduated with a Bachelor of Laws degree. In 2005, he and his wife migrated to Canada, where he practiced as a lawyer working for Legal Aid Alberta. He has also served as the Senior Technical Advisor for the Government of Alberta before running for public office. Please join me in welcoming Minister Madhu to the President's Summit. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Reeve McLaughlin for your kind introduction. And thank you to the leaders of our municipalities. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you to the organizers of the AUMA RMA President Summit on Policing. And thank you to my officials for joining me for this important presentation. I do want to say that I do have a few officials from my department with me today. We, we do have Dennis Cooley, my associate deputy minister, responsible for the solicitor general, Douglas Morgan, project principal of our provincial police service transition secretariat, Teresa Statnick, policy and research analyst, project principal of our Provincial Police Service Transition Secretariat, Brian Porter, Project Principal, APPS Transition Secretariat, Jessica Thompson, Director, Engagement and Strategy, Public Security Division. I would like to begin today by thanking you for inviting me to talk to you about the Alberta government's critical efforts to reform and modernize policing in our province. My comments will speak to two themes. First, the necessity of police reform in Alberta. And second, the function of the police transition study and how it will inform efforts to support those reforms. So let me start by talking about police reform. On slide number three before you, citizens throughout democratic societies are demanding reform to the way policing is done. We saw demonstrations in the United States in response to the death of George Floyd. And we continue to see it here in our budget. Our citizens were protesting in the streets of Edmonton, Calgary, Red Deer, and in other communities, all demanding meaningful change. They were contacting my office and asking hard questions about the police and some of the conduct captured on video. The common questions are, why am I seeing unacceptable police conduct on the news? Why are some citizens afraid to ask the police for help? Citizens are also telling me about racist interactions they have had with our law enforcement. Some have responded by saying, we need to defund the police. This approach, as many of you know, my view has always been that this approach is misguided. And I have resisted those calls emphatically because I know that the men and women of law enforcement risk their lives to protect and serve their fellow citizens. On slide number four, the government of Alberta is taking decisive action in response to legitimate concerns raised by citizens. Hence, the review of the Police Act, the first major update of this legislation since it was introduced in 1988. This is a significant undertaking that will shape the relationship between police 
and citizens for decades to come. We need an effective complaint resolution process that offers citizens a fast, effective, and independent process to bring forward concerns about police conduct. We need a modern governance framework that provides communities with input into establishing police priorities and ensures effective oversight of how police undertake their duties. We need to improve the experience of indigenous peoples with law enforcement and strengthen the relationship between indigenous communities and the police. We need to improve the public trust in police through collaboration between law enforcement, government, and community groups to co-determine solutions. Turning to slide number five, I want to talk about the transition study. It is important to put the provincial police transition study in the context of all of the work we are doing on police reform. The Alberta Fair Deal Panel consulted with tens of thousands of Albertans on a number of key issues facing the province. The panel heard from many Albertans, especially those in rural Alberta, about the law enforcement challenges in their communities. While many Albertans expressed their appreciation and respect for the work of the local RCMP members, they also expressed their frustration with the effectiveness of the RCMP policing in rural communities. To be clear, the Fair Deal Panel support is not a criticism of the hardworking rank and file men and women in the RCMP who serve our communities, but rather a concern about the realities of a police force that is ultimately managed from far away in Ottawa. The panel's report raised a number of specific concerns about the RCMP's ability to fulfill its contract policing mandate. Many are concerned that there is tension between the RCMP's responsibility to provide frontline police services to provincial and municipal government and with other policing objectives. As the Fair Deal Panel report stated, citizens often perceive the RCMP to be, over, to be overly bureaucratic and unwilling or unable to address local concerns because of competing priorities and ongoing struggles to adequately staff smaller rural communities. There were concerns about resourcing levels, response times, officer availability, and there were concerns about policing continuity in smaller, more remote communities where the frequent transfer of RCMP members reduced the connection between police and the communities they serve. After consultations with tens of thousands of Alberta citizens, and after all of their internal deliberations, the Fair Deal Panel made a clear recommendation to create an Alberta police service to replace the RCMP. More importantly, the government of Alberta has an obligation to listen to the concerns of its citizens and make an informed decision. When we as cabinet met to consider all of the recommendations of the Fair Deal Panel, we group the panel's recommendations into four categories. There were recommendations where work was already underway. There were recommendations that we agreed to in principle. There were recommendations that required further study. And there were recommendations that required modification. This recommendation fell into the third category and required further study. That is why we embarked on the transition study. Through this transition study, we have a responsibility to find out if there are new approaches to provincial policing. 
that can improve the safety and security of all operators. Again, this is about addressing the concerns of our burdens, not special interest groups. This study will allow the government of Alberta to make an informed decision on what is in the best interest of Albertans. I cannot state this enough. No decision has been made. The transition study will provide Alberta's government with an evidence-based and objective assessment of the factors associated with establishing an Alberta provincial police to assist cabinet consider the fair deal panel's recommendation. The potential transition from the RCMP to an Alberta provincial police is a complex undertaking with many aspects that need thorough examination. We have asked the contractor to assess all of the operational requirements necessary to extend up a provincial police service. All of the infrastructure, equipment, staffing, the information technology, and the operational policy that needs to be in place in order to facilitate a successful transition from the RCMP to an Alberta provincial police. The contractor is also looking at the transition process that will be implemented to move to a provincial police service. And finally, the contractor is looking at the cost to transition from the RCMP to an Alberta provincial police. Costing includes the estimates for all of the stages of a potential transition, including one-time capital cost, developmental cost, ongoing operational capital maintenance and renewal cost. On slide number seven, as part of this transition study, we have asked our contractor, PWC Canada, to examine how an Alberta provincial police service might capitalize on innovative ideas to enhance the delivery of police, policing services to Albertans in the 21st century. If the contractor's report simply recommends a model where the provincial police service provides the same levels of policing as is currently provided by the RCMP, that is to say, if we are simply swapping out the RCMP crest and uniforms for an Alberta crest and uniform, then it would not make sense to move forward. In this case, we will be paying more for the same level of service. That's not what Albertans expect of their government. The challenge we have given the contractor is to bring forward a model that provides value for taxpayer dollars, that improves levels of service to communities, that provides greater levels of community input and fosters community policing. We have asked PwC to make community policing a cornerstone of any potential provincial police service, to strengthen community voices in policing. The goal with any potential new provincial police will be to improve policing services for indigenous peoples, racialized communities, rural Albertans, and indeed all Albertans. The contractor is also exploring how an Alberta provincial police service could train and deploy a capable workforce that reflects Alberta's communities and provides meaningful policing career options for Albertans, as well as those who want to make Alberta their home. We have also asked PwC to develop a provincial police plan capable of delivering improved policing to both rural and urban Albertans, and to ensure that any transition plan is effective realistic and prioritizes public safety. Finally, P 
PwC will develop a custom model that clearly outlines the cost of any potential provincial police model, as well as the cost necessary to transition from the RCMP to an Alberta provincial police. Turning to slide eight, I want to talk a little bit about the factors we will consider when reviewing the report. I have heard the concerns expressed by many of you about what the provincial police service would cost and the impacts on your local policing services. I am making a commitment to you that the government of Alberta would not pursue a provincial police force unless it enhances community policing, increases the level of service for Albertans and does not impose additional costs onto municipalities. The government of Alberta understands that by establishing a provincial police service, the province will lose the federal contribution to RCMP policy. Currently, this amounts to around $160 million per year, compared to over $600 million per year spent by the province and municipalities. So, that is the challenge that we have asked our consultants to address. If we are going to lose the federal subsidy, can we offset some of those costs with improved levels of service, increased efficiencies, less bureaucracy, greater levels of community input into poli policing priorities, including additional investments, by the provincial government without adding extra cost on municipalities. The challenge for the contractor is to bring forward a model that includes an innovative organizational design, capitalizing on state-of-the-art technology and policing concepts to enhance policing services delivered in Alberta's communities. On slide number nine, now I want to address the work ahead. Again, no decision has been made. We expect the contractor to submit its final report to government by April 30th. After reviewing PwC's findings, and this is a critical point, Alberta's government will make a decision about whether to continue studying the feasibility of establishing a provincial police force. If cabinet decides to proceed with more analysis, I can assure that the government of Alberta will continue to consult with all key stakeholders, including members of this audience, to develop a transition plan that serves the best interest of Albertans. An undertaking like this cannot be made in a haste. It must be thoughtful, deliberate, and clearly understood by those affected. In closing, I want to go back to something I said earlier. Our goal with this endeavor is to make communities safer for all Albertans, no matter where they live in our province. Alberta's government believes that the key to achieving this goal is through effective community policing, ensuring that true legislation, policy, or, the, or in terms of organizational design, we want to make sure our police services remain accountable to our burdens, not at all. It also means looking at the relationship between the police and the people who depend on them. Finding ways to build stronger connections by making police more responsive to the needs of their communities and more representative of the people they serve. Our burdens deserve value for their taxpayer dollars and they deserve to be heard. And that is why we will continue to deliver a full common sense package on police reform. With that, President, thank you.
Great, thank you. And I believe uh, Doug Morgan's up next and then we'll take questions after the end of uh, Doug's presentation. So thank you, Minister, fantastic. Appreciate that and appreciate you're able to uh, attend for questions as well. So uh, Douglas Morgan, we'll get you to uh, up next if you've got control of the screen there. Uh, Paul, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, audio is good, thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon and thank you, Minister, and thank you to AUMA and RMA for the opportunity to speak to you today about the work that the Transition Studies contractor, PricewaterhouseCoopers, is currently engaged in. My name is Douglas Morgan, and I'm the project principal responsible for the Alberta Provincial Police Service Transition Secretariat, which is located within the Ministry of Justice and Solicitor General. The Secretariat is comprised of four Alberta Public Service employees who are responsible to support PricewaterhouseCoopers as it works to undertake its study. Building on the larger timeline the minister spoke to previously, uh, PwC is working through a five-phase project plan that started on October 12th, 2020, and concludes with the delivery of their final report on April 30th of this year. Since early October, PwC undertook two phases that ran concurrent to each other. Phase one consisted of a series of envisioning workshops that offered participants an opportunity to envision an integrated Alberta Provincial Police Service that works closely with public safety stakeholders to deliver a broader range of services. Also at this time, as part of phase two, PDBC worked closely with RCPK division to gather information on the current model of RCMP policing in Alberta. Due to the complexity of the Alberta policing model, PDBC continues to work on cataloging the current state of RCMP policing, which will see them incorporate information related to municipal police service agreements that the RCP and the Government of Canada has with some Alberta's uh, municipalities. PwC is currently in phase three of the transition study, which would see them building a future provincial police service model. Uh, this phase will conclude at the end of February uh, with their interim report and the completion of their innovative APPS model report. Uh, phase four will consist of PwC building both a transition roadmap and a plan that will, and that phase will end uh, in early April. A uh, phase five of PwC's uh, work will occur in the month of April and will consist of, of them building the final transition study report leading up to its uh, presentation to government on the 30th of April. As part of the transition study, a variety of stakeholders have been invited to participate first in PwC's workshops uh, that were during phase one, as well as during phase three, which we are currently in right now. In addition to stakeholders and partners, such as uh, municipal police services, First Nation Police Services, RCPK Division, Indigenous groups, the executive leadership of both AUMA and RMA have also been invited to attend and have participated in these workshops. PDBC has also conducted interviews with other stakeholders such as the National Police Federation, various government of Alberta ministries, and the Alberta Association of Police Governance. A PWC will be using the information gathered for these stakeholder discussions to inform their development of a potential future Alberta Provincial Police Service model and transition plan, which will be reflected in their final report. I thank you for your time today, and that concludes uh, my portion of the presentation. Great, uh, thank you, Doug Morgan, and thank you, Minister Madhu, and do appreciate you. Uh, this is such an important topic for all municipalities, and we appreciate you taking time to be here today. Um, looking at the clock, we'll. We'll field some questions, 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, please make sure that your questions are in the Q&A box and not in the chat box. Uh, and any questions that have gone unanswered, we'll definitely provide to the speakers and look for an answer at a later date as well. So I'll, I will choose randomly. Um, and uh, Lisa Wardley is asking, if provincial police takes place, how will policing on reserve be managed? How will shared de detachments that currently provide services to municipalities and on reserve move forward? Will this cause duplication? Thank you, uh, President, uh, for uh, that question. And thank you, uh, you know, let me say this, that we currently have a tripartite agreement with respect to uh, First Nation policing. Um, the cost is shared between the federal government and the provincial government. We have three First Nation communities that have got their own police services and commission. 
my my expectation is that that will continue to be the, the case. And I do not think that there is going to be a duplication in terms of infrastructure or detachment. Um, I do think that it presents an opportunity for us to make sure that uh, we have policing more closer to our people, to our communities across our province that are taken into circumstances, their local um, circumstances. If you, if you recall, I did introduce Bill 38 in the last legis legislature that recognized the, the First Nation policing and police services in the Police Act. So um, all of that particular work uh, would actually help if we should make that particular transition to the provincial police service. But again, that is one of the responsibilities that we have tasked the Price Waterhouse Coopers um, to, to investigate and to make sure that there isn't going to be unnecessary duplication of responsibilities because we want to make sure that we deploy manpower, both on the ground, resources to the communities where they are actually needed. Uh, Doug, do you have anything to supplement? Or uh, Dennis? Uh, nothing to add, Minister. Great, thank you, Minister, for the, uh, for the answer. Uh, I will go to Korean Krina from Northern Sunrise County. Minister Madhu, beginning in December, the Fair Deal panel consulted with individual burdens and stakeholder organizations through town hall sessions regarding replacing the RCMP with a provincial police force. These sessions were disappointingly seemed quite urban specific and did not obtain many views from rural parts of Alberta. In fact, many rural areas were not even aware of these sessions. How will you minister ensure that the voices of Albertans are heard going forward? Well, excellent question. I can assure that I am committed in making sure that um, all Albertans are heard on this issue. This is an important issue and one that also affects our rural communities, I would argue more than, um, more than any part of our province. And, and so, uh, you know, if there are uh, gaps in the consultation that took place in December, um, that did not adequately involve our rural uh, communities, um, I regret that. And I am going to make sure that, um, that the voices of our rural communities are heard because there are in so many ways, um, you know, consequential in, in how we move forward. And I have directed it and my deputy minister responsible for law enforcement is on this particular call. And I have also made it clear to um, the transition team that it is critically important that we hear from all Albertans who've got uh, something to say on the transition study, and in particular, folks from our rural community. So we will do, we will go back and we'll do our best to make sure that the voices of our rural communities are heard as we move forward. Great, thank you, Minister. Uh, Diane asks a question. With the reasoning of police reform as stated by the Minister, why can't these improvements and changes be made within current Alberta policing, along with conversations with the RCMP, Ottawa, and K Division, and municipal relationships for local policing needs? Now, uh, again, excellent question. As you heard it in my, in my remarks, uh, this is not about uh, the men and women of the RCMP uh, who do amazing work. Uh, you know, I have nothing but respect for the members of the RCMP. This is about our province. This is about the future of community policing in our province. 
um, it, it is easier to say that we can go back with our CMP and work out many of these uh, problems. Uh, we are talking about um, the now CMP that is managed and controlled from Ottawa down our, our, our province. And uh, we are not going to be the first province that have a provincial police. Ontario, Quebec, and one or two other province, provinces have got uh, provincial police in place. Um, every government, uh, leaders at the provincial level are elected to pursue what is in their people's best interest. Um, there are a lot of, a lot of uh, questions, a lot of issues that we need to uh, deal with in our province. For me, it comes down to the whole idea of community policing. And we have municipalities with municipal police services. Uh, in, in as much, I mean, and I would want to hear from them, we would want to hear from them, but at the end of the day, I want them to also consider um, those of our fellow citizens who are having difficulties with community policing. You know, in, in, I live in Edmond. If I make a 911 call, it takes about minutes away. There are fellow citizens who, when they make that 911 call, it takes about two hours on matters and life of death and security of our families and properties. That can be a long time. And I want to make sure that we are thinking through all of those things. And so, unfortunately, um, the relationship between Alberta and Ottawa is not at a, a good place right now. It's a consequence of issues that many of you here are aware of, but I want to make sure that uh, we are taking into consideration what is in our province's best interest and in our people's best interest as we make these foundational monumental decisions. Great, thank you, Minister. And anytime, Doug, you can jump in too. Um, next question, Jane's asking, my concern is who's going to pay for policing in small rural communities? At present time is paid for by both provincial and federal funding? So, so great question. Uh, again, as I said in my remarks, um, I have made a commitment to make sure that we do not add the extra cost on our municipalities at this point in time. And I also want to make sure that we are providing value and better services to the current levels of service. Now, if the, if the report comes back that doesn't provide for better services for our communities, um, more innovative uh, ways of policing in the 21st century, and more cost efficient because we have, we continue to make progress as a people, as a society, in terms of technology, innovation, and name it. And we should be building a modern police force that take into consideration all of those things. Uh, but I am not prepared to just have a, a report that does not add all of those values, but end up maintaining the same level of service or potentially could lead to an increased cost. I am very much aware that our, our, uh, you know, our folks are suffering right now. Municipal budgets are strained as a consequence of economic difficulties that we, that, I mean, that we face. And I, I don't want to add an additional layer of, of financial burden on them. So I, I am carefully weighing all of these options, but again, that is why we have this particular study that will report back to me on all of these things. Great, thank you, Minister. Uh, and please keep the questions coming. As of course, we're not gonna be able to get to all of them. They're fantastic questions. I love rural municipal leaders. You folks don't pull any punches and you guys like to, to let her out there. So 
I'm reading these verbatim, Minister, just to be clear, but uh, you can understand the passion that these folks have. The next one's by Ralph. Almost all crime in our community is perpetrated by the same habitual offenders, some over several decades. They are released on no cash bail. Oh, somebody deleted that one already, so I couldn't finish that one. <laughs> no, sorry, Paul. I just marked I just marked that you were answering it live. So if you go to the tab, I'm a little bit too eager. If you go to the answered tab and down there. Um, there we go. I got yeah. it. Yeah. Sorry, I'll be too. I'll be less eager in the future. <laughs> no problem, no problem. And I was I was trying to read it with the same passion it was written. Uh, again, Ralph, almost all crime in our community is perpetrated by the same habitual offenders, some over several decades. They're at least on no cash bail in hours every time. How does changing the logo on the door and the stripe on the pants fix that? Great question, Ralph. And that is why, you know, this whole exercise I can assure it's not about changing of crest and logo. If that is what this is all about, I would not be commissioning this particular study. I would not be embarking on this particular route. The issue of crime and rural crime and the catch and release, the revolving door is one that is real in our province, more real for many of our rural communities. The solution lies in taking a comprehensive look at all of the issues, all of the factors that contribute to that. That is why I have embarked on the review of the Police Act. That is why I have, we have embarked on several um, justice statutes, um, um, policies and review. That is why we have embarked on, you know, we've made amendment to the Traffic Safety Act with respect to uh, traffic violations, ticket and administrative um, reviews uh, and, you know, dealings with all kinds of regulatory offenses. And that is why we continue to push on the federal government on the need for them to take, continue to take a harder look at the criminal code, because that is a legislation that is entirely within their purview. And, but that is why it's also important that if there are things that are within our control as a province that we can do to strengthen our law enforcement, strengthen the presence of community policing in our communities, that we do all of that. And I think that is one of the lens with which we are looking at you know, this transition study. Again, the RCMP, great Canadian organization, great men and women in uniform. Um, this is not, once again, about those courageous officers. It's about us being in charge of our own destiny and of our, of our own community security. Great. Thank you, Minister. And I'll, I'll make this the last question. I want to appreciate your time. I know you need to get out and I do want to give you the final word, but I do want to throw one more question out there. Again, folks, all your questions here, we will provide to the to the Minister and uh, to Mr. Morgan as well and ensure that we provide an answer to you. Lisa had stated the concern stated over and over is about continuity on staffing in smaller rural and remote communities. And that somehow a provincial police service would cure that. How is that going to happen? And continuing on, recruiting and retention across every sector is, is an ongoing issue in small and rural communities, teachers, health, policing, municipal staff, industry workers, and every other job for that matter. The RCMP seem to have, seem to have more luck than most at filling positions, even if they are for three-year terms, again, longer than most sectors. So again, um, good comment, uh, um, another, way of looking at the issues that we are dealing with. And that's why I, I welcome all perspectives. That's why I want to hear broadly from our province and our people. But suffice it to say that uh, we have jurisdictions with their own municipal police services. We have jurisdictions that the RCMP are responsible for. Every province is unique. Every province is different. And so we want to make sure that we are providing the services and the value 
that members of our community will expect from their government, from their police services. And I can assure that for me to move forward with this project, all of those questions will be answered, that there's going to be more resources on the ground. We are going to have a, a structure that is going to ensure that uh, our police services and resources are much more closer to our people. So I, again, I welcome these conversations. I, I welcome the, all of your feedback and I look forward to continuing to engage to make sure that we get this right. Well, thank you very much, Minister Magoo, Madhu. I do appreciate it. And, and Mr. Morgan, any final comments by yourself as well? No, sir. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Great. Well, we do appreciate your time, Minister. And I think that, uh, again, and thanks for all the fantastic questions. We have 66 questions. So you can tell there's a tremendous amount of passion in rural municipal leaders. And thank you for all the efforts of putting these questions together. Uh, I think it's it's fantastic, and I think you can show that the passion yourself for finding good solutions for modern policing in Alberta, as well as from uh, the members that are participating today. So thanks again, much appreciated. We'll let you continue on with their day. We'll take a we'll take a three minute break, folks, and then we'll get back on the show. So thanks again, Minister, and thank you, Mr. Morgan. Much appreciated. And pre and President, before I go, uh, I can see that there are several questions that we did not get to. If it is possible to compile those questions and send them to my department. And we will prepare a response to each and every one of them and send it back to, uh, to your organization to share with your members. Thank you, yeah, Minister, thanks. much appreciated. Yeah, we can definitely do that. Um, thanks, Minister. We'll send you the questions and a copy of all the comments. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't know if we wanna maybe just forego the three minute break and take a longer break later. Does that work for you guys? All right. Let's Thank do it. Thanks again, Take care. Okay. So, Carol, we'll go over to you for trivia. Ready to go. Hey, okay, okay. sounds good. I'm ready to roll. This has been fun. This is the fun part of the session. The question is, in February of 2020, a man stole a donation box from an Airdrie Tim Hortons by hiding it behind what item? A, a box of Timbits, B, a cowboy hat, C, a rubber chicken, or D, a box of desserts. I use a finish to uh, get your answers. Just wait for the screen to change. So the answer is C. Our RCP nicknamed the man, the chicken bandit, in a tweet. Which is surveillance footage. Um, All right. On to the next question. In the report agreed to hear cases of all Yeah, Carrie, you're cutting in and out again. Point for sophisticated charge. Oh, Kara, did we lose you? All right. Okay, can you guys hear me now? Yeah, we're having trouble with your feed, Kara. So um, do you want to keep working on that? And we're, uh, we'll just step in for a bit to get your connection fixed. Or hey. So um, 
Anyway, we're just going to continue with this question. So in September 2020, the Supreme Court agreed to hear a case involving the ringleader of a 20-person syndicate charged with fraud, trafficking in stolen goods, and thefts of what substance? Alberta crude oil, Quebec maple syrup, Faller, uh, Faller, sorry, honey, or Ontario ice wine? Go ahead and make your selection. I didn't have the music though, Kara, sorry. And the correct answer is maple syrup. 9,500 barrels of maple syrup valued at $18 million uh, were stolen from a Quebec warehouse in 2011 and 2012. And I don't know where all of it went, but I, Marianne, if you're out there, I know where some of it went. All right, next, I'm going to turn it over to Jocelyn to introduce our next speaker, Jocelyn. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jocelyn Lanavez. I'm the counselor for the village of Manville and director of Villages East for AUMA. And I did know about the, the maple syrup, but I didn't know about the rubber chicken. I hadn't heard that one. So that's actually kind of neat. Uh, it's time now to introduce our next guest speaker. It's Deputy Commissioner Curtis Zablocki, commanding officer for the RCMPK division. Born and raised in rural Saskatchewan, Deputy Commissioner Curtis Zablocki is a 28-year veteran of the RCMP. He holds a bachelor's degree in criminology from the University of Alberta and has spent most of his RCMP career in Alberta, carrying out various operational duties in district advisory and detachment command functions. As commanding officer of the K Division, Deputy Commissioner Zablocki has focused on community engagement and collaboration with partners and stakeholders in the area of rural crime and race relations. Thank you so much for joining us today, uh, De Deputy Commissioner Zablocki. And thank you, Jocelyn, for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the invitation and the opportunity uh, to speak with you today. Uh, I do want to uh, acknowledge uh, Minister Madhu and his participation. I'm not sure if he's still with us uh, on the line or not, uh, but also Presidents uh, Morishida and McLaughlin, uh, their executives, and all elected officials of uh, Alberta communities and their staff that are joined in on the, uh, on the Zoom conference today. I also want to introduce uh, Nina Sahasrabudi, who uh, is with me in, uh, in the room here. And Nina is our Executive Director for our strategy business and innovation uh, program here in K Division. So she'll be participating uh, with me. She's our expert uh, when it comes to those conversations and the work around uh, finances and such, uh, police costing. So I've always said that the best days uh, as a commanding officer are those days when I can get out and meet and listen to our elected officials, our communities and Albertans, whether it's been at your conventions or community visits or now in our new world, of Zoom meetings. The AUMA and RMA and the citizens you represent are our biggest stakeholders. We're here to work with you and support you in keeping you and your communities safe. Historically, our relationships with you and the communities you represent have been strong. And I'm happy to say that that continues today. Those relationships are vital and we both greatly benefit from them. Policing, not like, not unlike other professions and institutions in society, is constantly in a state of evolution. We must be able to respond to how our citizens' needs and environments are changing. We must continually leverage our intelligence and data to look forward to what issues our citizens might face in the future. Policing is not without its challenges, and these aren't unique to Alberta or Albertans. A lot of the challenges that you see today, rural crime, prolific offenders, drug abuse, mental illness, or more specific policing challenges like recruiting, systemic racism, or diversity are challenges that are being faced by police services across the province and across the country. Within the past 12 months, police professionals have seen challenges related to COVID-19, blockades and protests, some of those based in economics, some in social issues, as well as a world seeing rapid impact and advancement in technology. All services have responded to these challenges, no matter the color of the uniform or the stripe on their pants. 
I have a lot that I'd like to share with you this afternoon, including some discussion around responsibilities and obligations of parties within the policing, policing agreements. We can talk about policing cost uh, structure and what the police service delivery looks like in Alberta today, as well as how your service is evolving. We're gonna, we'll get started with some information on the contract and policing agreements, and I will just see if I can activate my share screen here. And I think that should do it. it. Looks right from my end. I hope it does with you as well. Well, it's not letting me advance. One second, please. Oh, I saw the hey. slide change. <laughs> We're good. Tremendous. Okay. So we'll start first with, with uh, a little bit of information around uh, the contract uh, and uh, policing priorities. It's important to know a bit about the policing contract in order to speak to how policing services are guided, governed, and provided. When we talk about contract policing, we include both the police services agreement and the Municipal Police Services Agreement. These agreements are similar in many ways. Under the Police Services Agreement, the Provincial Police Services Agreement, the RCMP has been contracted by the government, government of Alberta to be their Provincial Police Service. This agreement is negotiated between Public Safety Canada and the province of Alberta. The current Police Service Agreements were signed in 2012 and are in effect for 20 years. The agreements are based on some key principles. Both parties are committed to a more cooperative and collaborative relationship to oversee and implement the policing agreement. Both contract parties receive mutual benefits. The costs of contract policing are shared in recognition of the mutual benefits of the policing model. There are many articles contained within the agreement that govern how we operate, but I will identify a few of the key areas that are important to understand in the context of what control influence input the provincial minister has in relation to the provincial police service. Under the PPSA, as a commanding officer for the RCMP, I act under the direction of the provincial minister in aiding the administration of justice in the province and carrying into effect the laws enforced therein. It's the provincial minister that sets the objective priorities and goals of the provincial police service. There are a number of items that require the provincial minister's agreement, such as the number and location of detachments and units and any changes to the organizational structure, such as opening, closing, or moving a detachment, or increases to the number of personnel, capital investment, and any changes to resource deployment. The minister will set in consultation with the commissioner the level of police and service to be provided to the provincial police service or by the provincial police service. This is determined via funding from the province and includes resource levels, such as a number of police officers and civilian employees. Under the agreement, the commissioner also consults with the minister before appointing the commanding officer, the criminal operations officer, or the deputy criminal, deputy criminal operations officer. This consultation usually takes the form of participation on selection boards. And then it's my responsibility as the commanding officer to implement and action the objectives, the priorities and the goals as determined by the provincial minister. And to the extent possible, deploy personnel and equipment to reflect the provincial priorities. This is achieved through a strong working relationship and a great deal of interaction with the senior assistant deputy minister and his staff. It includes regular provision of HR reports financial reports, multi-year financial plans. It includes resource deployment discussions, joint business planning, frequent meetings between myself, the ADM and his staff, 
an almost daily interaction and dialogue between the ministry and our staff at a multitude of levels. A national contract management committee made up of provincial and territorial representatives from across the country is in place to support the delivery of professional, efficient and effective police services under the agreement to meet the evolving needs of each party and to give contract partners a voice on costs and delivery of local police services. In addition to the provincial representatives, Tanya Thorne represents municipalities and MPSAs on this committee. All ensure that Alberta's voice is heard at the national level on the policing agreement. Like all police services in Alberta, we must also adhere to the policing standards set out by the government of Alberta. The Alberta RCMP almost always exceeds the policing standards set in this province. So these are some of the important aspects of the agreement that provide the province with control, input, and influence into the Provincial Police Service Administration and service delivery, while still maintaining the important and necessary independence of the police. Sorry, Curtis, are you, um, are, are we on different slides other than the cost sharing arrangement? Kelly, I believe we are. No. Okay, I'm not sure if the slides have been advancing with you. Because we were still, yeah, yeah, we're no, still seeing the provincial police municipal policing slide. Yeah, it looks like it advanced too far, and I'm not sure that we're going to be able to resolve this. Let me go back. Okay, I have a little bit of fluidity there. Okay. So you're seeing the slide that I just finished talking about, unfortunately. Okay. Fortunately, right. we're moving to the one that you've had in front of you for a bit there now. Thanks, Curtis. Okay, great, thank you. So understandably, there's a lot of interest in policing costs. Given the complexities of the numerous cost arrangements, consolidated services and non-billable items relevant to policing, it's difficult for me to easily provide you with the total cost of policing. However, I will describe some of the cost structures for you today. It is important to understand the cost share arrangements reflect the benefits that all contract partners, federal, provincial, and municipal, receive from the integrated model of the RCMP, provincial policing. As I mentioned earlier, the government of Alberta has entered into the provincial police service agreement with the government of Canada. As per this agreement, Alberta pays 70% of provincial policing costs, while Canada pays 30%. Also notable is that the Alberta Law Enforcement Response Team, or ALERT, with over 300 resources, is funded under the same cost share arrangement with Public Safety Canada. Each municipality with a population of over 5,000 has entered into a municipal policing agreement with the Government of Canada. For communities over 15,000, the municipality pays 90% and the federal government contributes 10% of the total costs. While communities whose population is over 5,000 but under 15,000 pay 70% of the costs while the federal government contributes 30%. It should be noted that communities of this size benefit from a pooled cost formula for items such as vehicles, IT equipment and training, which assists smaller municipalities in leveling out the costs on a year-to-year -year basis. Based on the cost share agreements in 2020-2021, the federal government will contribute approximately $164 million to provincial and municipal policing in Alberta. In addition to the cost share agreements outlined in the contracts, there are a number of non-billable items and consolidated services that contract partners both provincial and municipal benefit from, but are either not billed for or only pay a portion of the costs. Some of the non-billable areas, such as departmental security, employee management services, including conf conflict resolution or conduct management, legal services and civil litigation are not billed to the contract partners. Consolidated services include areas such as human resource management, corporate management and communications, 
and they're paid through the division administration charge, allowing these costs to be consolidated and shared amongst all contract partners. There are also a number of national programs, such as policy development and training and equipment research and development that are not charged to contract partners. And it's difficult to attribute a specific dollar amount to these items, but they are necessary items that contribute to the overall structure or infrastructure needed to support contract policing. Before I move away from the cost structures, I know many of you have questions or may have questions around unionization and the cost impacts to your communities. As you know, Treasury Board and the newly formed National Police Federation representing RCMP members across Canada are currently in negotiations for their first agreement. I obviously don't know what the results of those negotiations are going to be, but it's a fairly safe assumption that this will result in an increase in compensation for RCMP members. For the past couple of years, we've been advising municipalities of this and suggesting that where possible, monies be set aside should an increase occur. We'll move to HR and I'll talk a bit about recruiting, staffing and member transfers. This year alone, we added over 200 new resources to the Alberta RCMP with approximately 120 of those being new positions or new growth. And that comes from the police funding model, uh, new growth on the MPSAs, new growth in alert, and also new growth in the community tripartite agreements, tripartite agreements uh, for some of our Indigenous communities. It really was an exceptional year for growth in the midst of a pandemic where we had to close depot for a period of about three months and then slowly, gradually, and cautiously restart. Our HR personnel have done an outstanding job this year, meeting the demand for this growth and the expectations of the province and our communities. Over the past few years, we've achieved a consistent output of 40 troops annually graduating from depot. We'll be down to 34 troops next fiscal because of the pandemic, and then hopefully back up to 40 troops the following year. With this capacity, we brought hard vacancy rates down in the Alberta RCMP to approximately 1%, and that was pre-pandemic. Our soft vacancy rates fluctuate throughout the year and are a factor of maternity and paternity leaves, sick leaves, suspensions, other special leaves. We continue to examine potential strategies to address these soft vacancies. Concerns about the turnover of members in communities via transfer that our members are well engaged, well established in their communities, and then they're transferred out. The RCMP does have a mobility policy and the philosophy behind this policy is multifold. Transfers provide our police officers with a variety of different policing experiences that contribute to a more well-rounded police officer. Transfers bring value to communities, experience, new or fresh ideas, and new ways to serve communities. Transfers provide us as an organization an increased ability to fill locations that are sometimes challenging or difficult to fill. We know that not all communities are created equal and filling more remote, isolated or smaller communities that have less services is a challenge for any provincial police service. We do incentivize transfers to some postings and this is done by providing consideration for the next transfer if they're interested in a specific or preferred posting. In many instances, after a commitment of time to a location, some members have a desire to move and they move for different reasons. They move for new experiences and opportunities, for promotions, or to get closer to family, just to name a few. But the reality today is that we don't transfer our police officers near as much as we used to. It's common that many start and finish their policing careers in the same province and some in the same local areas. Many were born and raised here, while others have chosen to make Alberta their permanent home and have lived here for many years. Our members and employees are proud of the work of where they work and live and bring a diverse background of experience to the Alberta RCMP. These are Albertans serving Albertans.
I will assume that that was the end um, and that now we have some time to, to take some questions. Um, Hi, Jocelyn. It's Curtis here. No, that's not our end. Okay. Just having a little bit more technical difficulty there. I'm so very sorry. Apologize for that. I'm going to uh, see if I can see if I can move this along here again. Okay, I think we're back on track. Okay, I will mute off again. Thanks for that. The police funding model is a great example of our flexibility to fulfill, fulfill HR commitments. We have for many years through the multi-year financial plan process, identified the need to invest in more resources for rural policing in Alberta. Positions realized through the new police funding model has allowed us to allocate resources in areas and programs fo focused on rural crime. In total, over the four years, it's anticipated we will receive approximately 275 regular member positions and 245 civilian positions. Providing a comprehensive police service to the citizens of Alberta means we need to balance putting resources in our detachments, resources in support services, such as forensic identification sections, police dog services, general investigation sections, resources that directly support the front line and also in our specialized services, those that are focused on collaboratively addressing the root causes of crime and supporting vulnerable marginalized populations. Resource deployment in year one hit all three of these areas with the allocations determined in consultation with JSG and with the knowledge, input and feedback of partners, stakeholders, as well as internal consultation and analysis of requirements. The Alberta RCMP is structured to be flexible, responsive, and versatile. We're able to move and share resources, not only across business lines, but across municipal and provincial jurisdictions in a timely and cost-effective manner. This means Albertans have instant access to policing resources and equipment that can rapidly deploy and respond to emergencies and significant events. Our multiple service delivery lines at the municipal, provincial, territorial, national, and international level allow for the flow of intelligence between all levels of policing, which is absolutely critical in today's world. Our analysts have access to intelligence from across the country and internationally through our liaison program and our Five Eyes Partnership, an intelligence alliance comprising of Australia, Canada, New Zealand, the United Kingdom, and the United States. This ensures we're alive to any threats to Canadian citizens or infrastructure. Federal policing provides investigative expertise and overall economies of scale from a public safety standpoint at virtually no cost to the PPSA budget. Federal policing provides Albertans with a national security presence that is integrated, collaborative, and well supported by intelligence from national and international law enforcement partners, including Interpol. Federal policing works on cyber crimes intelligence and investigative capacity responding to cyber related calls for service in Alberta. Money laundering and counter illicit financial crimes are occurring in Alberta. Federal policing has the ability to share information and work seamlessly with provincial RCMP police resources to investigate these kinds of crimes. Federal criminal intelligence resources are located in each district in, in Alberta and they allow for close collaboration, further enhancing investigations. Our federal teams also operate in a variety of functionally specialized fields, including covert operations, air services, digital forensic services, explosive disposal unit, and protective security services. They are continuously supporting operations that benefit and ensure the safety of Albertans. This includes operations such as ATM theft rings, organized crime, gun and drug trafficking, national security files, including terror-related offenses, child exploitation investigations, significant border drug seizures, money laundering, and high value fraud investigations. And as well as providing assistance and support to over 195 alert investigations in 2019, 2020. The federal policing program in Alberta is primarily focused on anything that has a nexus to Alberta and contributes greatly to the safety and security of Albertans. 
I'll talk a little bit about rural crime. I know rural crime is a primary concern for Albertans as it is for the Alberta RCMP, and it remains a driving factor in our operations in the province. In late 2017, with property crime rates at a high and with a new resource allocation, the Alberta RCMP began development of a provincial crime reduction strategy. This strategy is an organizational and community involved approach built on intelligence and data analysis at the core of the four pillars of policing that all operational activities fall under. Under the targeted prevention pillar, some of our activities include working with crime impacted citizens, citizen led groups and communities in education, prevention, enhanced vig vigilance and crime awareness, using initiatives like Project Lockup to assist those Albertans hit hardest by property crime. The Proposed Data Center and the Callback Unit are two of our newer initiatives that fall under the suppression pillar. By reducing administrative burden, using civilian data entry staff, as well as leveraging our regular members and restricted duties, we're able to free up time members would normally spend on data entry for a call for service. Our frontline members are encouraged to use this time to conduct targeted patrols or focus on more serious investigations. These patrol areas are determined through intelligence gleaned from police data and crime analysis. Amongst many other efforts under the apprehension pillar, our crime reduction units and detachment members are using the data gathered from your communities to identify and apprehend offenders who are causing the most harm. The most significant offenders are targeted by the district crime reduction units and special operations to disrupt their criminal activities. The offender management pillar is also an important part of our holistic approach to reducing crime. The same priority offenders are targeted in the offender management program. This program is focused on identifying the root causes of why the offender is involved in crime and aims to break the cycle by using an integrated multidisciplinary approach. The Integrated Offender Management Initiative has been initiated in six communities and is growing. It relies on partnerships between health and social agencies and the Alberta RCMP. There's been a 36% reduction in recidivism with offenders that chose to work with us within this program. We've also introduced units and projects like online crime reporting, public facing crime mapping, and the callback unit, all initiatives that increase awareness about public safety, lower the barriers to reporting crime, thereby improving our data and intelligence, and increase the operational effectiveness of the front line. I'll talk briefly uh, to some of the crime trends that we're seeing. <coughs> In Alberta, in RCMP jurisdiction over the four year period of 2017 to 2020, we've seen a 14% decrease in property crime, a 16% decrease in break and enters, a 29% decrease in theft of vehicles, and a 30% decrease in theft under $5,000. It's important to acknowledge the pandemic and how it has contributed to the reduction in property crime this past year and continues to bring our numbers down early in 2021. From 2019 to 2020, in Alberta RCMP jurisdictions, we've seen 11% decrease in property crime, a 17% decrease in break and enters, a 19% decrease in theft of vehicles, and a 22% decrease in theft under $5,000. But again, with the pandemic as well, came a 4% increase in persons crimes over the previous year, including increases in the areas of domestic violence. Communities can't be made safer by policing alone. Crime is often driven by multiple factors, including economic conditions, poverty, addictions, mental health, or an overburdened justice system. We work closely with social and health agencies and recognize there are root causes of crime that also need to be addressed. We also know that response times is a concern for our rural residents. And with the large geographic areas of our detachments, many of them hundreds of square kilometers in area. For obvious reasons, response times in rural settings are not comparable to urban settings. Ultimately, there are a number of factors impacting response times, but the primary factor is the location of the nearest police officer. We know this is a concern for rural Albertans, and we continually look for ways to enhance our response including the implementation of zone policing in some areas, hubbing of detachment shift schedules where it makes sense, 
and supporting the provincial implementation of the RAPID initiative. Police services constantly evolve and change, just like the communities we serve. The Alberta RCMP recognizes there are always challenges on the horizon, and we're prepared to meet them with innovation, humanity, and efficiency. Policing is for all people, and the Alberta RCMP is working in these areas to broaden understanding and reflect the communities we serve. In consultation with the Indigenous communities, we have developed a reconciliation strategy that grows with the needs of Albertans and begins to answer and respond to the calls to action. We are a week away from launching the Commanding Officers Diversity Advisory Council. Our aim is to hear from the diverse people and communities we serve and ask them to help guide us how we serve communities while respecting and understanding their cultural differences. We're developing our equity, diversity, and inclusion strategy for the Albert RCMP. This strategy will ensure we're mindful of not only who we serve, but those who serve for us. This strategy will guide us in recruiting, communicating, and ensuring that all of our efforts in this area are cohesive and aligned. We're working closely with Alberta Health Services to develop a provincial strategy to expand our rural police and crisis teams in order to be present in more communities across Alberta and provide appropriate and compassionate response to those experiencing a mental health crisis. Today, we have five communities here in Alberta that are benefactors of the RPAC program and will soon be expanding to six and eventually into regions across the province of Alberta. Technology and data is guiding the generation of policing. And I can tell you the Alberta RCMP is continually looking for ways to improve service delivery to its citizens, to increase efficiency for our frontline and leverage technology to benefit communities while keeping them safe. Data to action is an excellent example of how we're changing the way we police. It's research-based, integrated, and accountable. Data to action brings many units, analysts, and partners to the table to share information and focus our efforts on those who hurt our communities the most. Our integrated partnerships at local and executive levels, including partners like Corrections Canada, Alberta Corrections, the Alberta Sheriffs, and, and many others, ensure information sharing is seamless, strategies are aligned, and results are measured. Our teams and the actions they take are focused. And when those strategies have been deployed, we examine the effects of the operations and adjust when and where needed. We will be expanding this initiative to include more communities. As well, we're now moving to include persons crimes, allowing us to include more serious issues that impact community safety. We're also continuing our work in a number of areas that will not only benefit citizens, but find efficiencies for the frontline officers. These initiatives include a repeat victimization strategy. This will ultimately allow us to identify those victims who are most vulnerable and what factors are influencing that vulnerability. We'll be working closely with health and social organizations, as well as communities to accomplish this. Improving communications with our citizen-led community safety groups like Rural Crime Watch and Citizens on Patrol by enabling access to a mass notification communication system. We're engaged in online video evidence gathering, online crime reporting, public crime mapping, and continued exploration into a variety of internal and external apps to streamline service delivery. A critical aspect of developing trust and confidence in policing is the ability to have a strong voice or input into your policing services. For RCMP police communities in Alberta, this voice can and does come in many ways. Our annual performance plan or APP allows for elected officials, other community leaders and stakeholders to develop the policing priorities for their communities. Consultation is key to this process, and we're working to ensure a rigorous consultation process is utilized in spite of the pandemic. Strong relationships between mayors, Reeves, and their councils, community agencies, and groups are the norm in Alberta communities. Our detachment commanders, or your chiefs of police, understand how important things like communication, engagement, responsiveness, and transparency are to these relationships. Through the development and use of community reporting templates, we're strengthening the reporting we provide to elected officials and communities regarding resource deployment, including vacancy patterns, 
financial information, crime trends, updates on the annual performance plan, community engagement by your police service, and community safety issues. This documenting and then this reporting is tailored to your informational needs. Community police advisory committees provide communities a voice in policing and can also contribute to police oversight. In many provincial RCMP police communities, these committees can take the shape of an informal police advisory body. While in MPSA or municipal RCMP police communities, advisory functions and oversight can be provided more formally through a municipally authorized policing committee. Both informal and formal committees can be involved in setting priorities for policing in their communities, communicating interests and participating in the development of annual plans. The Interim Police Advisory Board comprised of AUMA, RMA and AAPG members is another voice in policing, recently established by the province with a mandate to provide input into the minister and then to the commanding officer on policing priorities, goals and objectives. Our engagement with the interim board has been invaluable as we continually work to ensure we are meeting the needs of the communities we serve. You can see that there are many ways to provide input into your policing services. The Alberta RCMP will continue to be flexible and receptive to models and concepts of community advice, input and oversight. And lastly, you should know that one of my priorities for our service here in Alberta is community engagement. You are and will see enhanced consultation, things like regular town halls, community meetings, interagency meetings, much of it virtual for now, coffee breaks with the police, participation at community events, and an open invitation for you to invite and include your police officers to participate in your community. I wanna thank you again for the opportunity to participate here this afternoon. We're proud to police here, to live here and work in Alberta and call this home. There's much we can do and want to do with you as your Alberta Provincial Police Service. Thank you. Now I can take over, right? <laughs> now you can take over. Thank I you. will try and stop sharing here and Thank get you. back online. Okay, awesome. Thank you so very much, Deputy Commissioner. Um, uh, you folks have such a tough job and I personally appreciate everything that you have on your plates and especially in rural rural Alberta it, we're all we're all in this together for sure uh, so we do have some time to answer some questions and we'll just I guess I'll start at the top and then there's a few that I'll I, I want to cover but we'll start out with Minister Madhu clearly articulated the provincial government wants to replace the RCMP with a provincial police force. Please tell us what the RCMP is doing to change this direction or this narrative. We're really, we're really uh, taking a, a strong focus on, as I mentioned in my presentation, community engagement and ensuring that our communities have a voice in policing. And you just heard me uh, account for a number of, of uh, different opportunities from police advisory committees to to, uh, to boards and such, uh, our annual performance planning process as well, that give our communities that opportunity to have input. So that's very important. Um, there's, there's an adage developed by Sir Robert Peel, the, the father, known to be the father of, of policing many, many years ago, that the police are the people and the people are the police. So we really want to live by that, ensure our communities have input participation, and that uh, obviously will help us meet uh, the needs of, of changing and evolving communities. So how many, uh, how many of the new 200 officers are in the actual field boots on the ground? Do you know that, that answer? In the field and boots on the ground, yes. Um, we have 66 out of 76 regular members uh, currently in the field. Um, 46, um, 46 possessions, positions of the uh, total allotment are assigned to rural detachments and 45 of those are filled and one is pending in a staffing action. And uh, there are, are a few that are in process. However, those are uh, 
positions that are of more of a specialized nature and won't be positioned uh, on our front line uh, in our communities necessarily. Okay. Uh, is there an internal shift within RCMP happening that will start to put a better emphasis on communication and allowing individual RCMP municipal detachments to start taking charge of their ability to post on social media and not have to wait for the K division or hire to approve the type of communication with the police or with the public, sorry. Yeah, thank you for that question. Enhanced communications is one of the areas that we heard from the interim police advisory board on. And uh, we, are, uh, we are focusing more uh, in that context. We have had some discussions around how we can uh, work with our municipalities and uh, um, work with them to, to provide communications across their areas. There are some challenges around that. And, and, and I think on an individual basis with our municipalities, we'll continue to work to, to, uh, to derive solutions. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you expand on how the RCMP define community policing and what they're obligated to do to ensure that all municipalities are involved? Yeah, certainly, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me, thank you for that question as well. So community policing is, you know, I think you've heard me say it a few times, it's about being engaged in our communities. It's about working with our communities, being on top of what the needs uh, of our communities are and, and ensuring that our communities have input. And as, as I said, towards the end of my presentation, that community engagement is a, is a priority for me. It's a priority for our police service moving forward here in Alberta. And uh, it, 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 it's, it's crucial. It's crucial to community safety. It's crucial to ensuring that we have the trust and confidence uh, of our communities. Um, how many of uh, our CMP officers and support staff are actually dedicated to Alberta? I think you said the number, but I, did, I didn't get it. Yeah, I'm not sure if I gave you a, a, a total number. I can, I can tell you that uh, total number of employees in Alberta, <clears throat> excuse me, through all our, our business lines is, uh, is, is over 4,000. Uh, on the Provincial uh, Police Services Agreement, uh, our numbers are, are over 1,600. On the Municipal Police Services Agreement, uh, those numbers are, uh, are over 1,100. Uh, they fluctuate a bit from time to time. So I'm, I'm not a, able to give you specifics, but that will give you an idea of, uh, of uh, some of those numbers. Okay. Uh, if Ottawa mandates or rolls out a national program or initiative, what ability do you, do you have to apply an Alberta lens to them? Well, that's something that we, do with consistency and, and in a routine fashion. If Ottawa is rolling out a, a program, uh, for example, uh, we've recently rolled out our equity, diversity and inclusive strategy, and that's a national strategy. But we here in, uh, in Alberta have also built an, an EDI strategy for the province. And when we build these respective strategies, we ensure that we have alignment between our divisions or our provinces and our national efforts. So that's certainly the case, uh, um, you know, with things like uh, equity, diversity, inclusiveness. It's the case with strategies such as our mental health and our wellness strategies that we have as well. And uh, that alignment is, is very important and, and critical to, to proper service delivery. Um, you know, we, we've heard a little bit about uh, the bureaucracy around uh, national headquarters and, and maybe more specifically Ottawa but you know, really Ottawa and our national headquarters are there to support our contracts. They're there su to support uh, provincial policing and territorial policing across the country. And they do so in examples, as I, as I just mentioned with those different strategies. You had mentioned that there was uh, about 40 new recruits. How many retirements on average are, are there coming through the, the pipe there? So I could speak uh, maybe more specifically to attrition in the context of retirements, uh, exits uh, from the RCMP for different, different reasons. But about annually, uh, those numbers will be approximately 80 
uh, policing positions annually. So when I talked about 100 positions as new growth uh, this year in Alberta, um, we add to that another 80 positions that that uh, we fill uh, because of attrition, and 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 you know come to the number of approximately 200 new resources that we need uh, into the division, into the province. And, and we're really pleased with uh, the output that we've uh, received from Depo and the support in that context this year. And you're always moving and growing and, and, and holding on to technology and, and all that kind of good stuff. Considering the size and the areas being covered in rural policing, is there an increase in air services being contemplated? Not specifically. I could say not specifically at, at this time. Uh, obviously, we we reserve air services, uh, you know, for operational functions. You know, administratively, uh, we we really really limit the uh, the administrative uh, use of of our uh, aircraft, our fleet in that context, and just to ensure they're. Uh, uh, operationally uh, ready to respond and, and, and be available. Uh, it's also from Barbara here, Barbara Smith from the Village of Boyle. She had wanted to know what are those in the high ranking positions within the RCMP doing to advocate to change the catch and release issues that we're experiencing in rural communities? I think that's a, a sort of a common common thread with all of us. Yeah, yeah. No, it's not. Uh, it's not something something that we're uh, not in tune with. Uh, you know, we we have the same concerns that our communities do. Uh, we're regularly, frequently engaged with uh, with the province here, uh, who are responsible for the administration of justice, uh, and and having discussions with um, you know at, at the at the deputy minister, assistant deputy minister levels. We're certainly passing on our concerns. We're passing along the concerns that we hear from, uh, from communities as well too. Uh, you'll recall you know, a government announcement uh, approximately two years ago, um, adding additional crown prosecutors. Um, you know, that would be helpful. I'm not exactly sure where they are with their deployment of those additional resources, but uh, you know, I, I think in time, um, those efforts will will pay dividends, and and uh, um, hopefully we won't have you know some of what we hear around a revolving door uh, in our communities. Uh, the auxiliary from Dwayne Rawson. Uh, the auxiliary program was very useful to members at the detachments. Is this program going to come back? Thanks for the question, Dwayne. Uh, we're hopeful that that program comes back. Uh, it's been in limbo for a period of time now, uh, and uh, there's been some some good work to to uh, uh, I would say modernize the program to deal with concerns around uh, liability, uh, to uh, develop uh, MOUs that will uh, that will clearly uh, highlight and outline uh, the working arrangements uh, that are necessary within that particular program. So we hope to have that program uh, back in our communities. We, we certainly saw the value of the auxiliary program in our communities and supporting uh, not only our members on the front line, but, but, uh, but specifically our communities. And, and we really enjoyed and valued the participation of community members in that program as it added a tremendous value to our service delivery. <clears throat> These, these uh, questions just keep multiplying, which is awesome. This is, uh, how much is the RCMP having to spend to defend their existence because of these, these discussions on the provincial police forces? You know, I don't know that we've uh, had to spend anything to, to defend our existence. I, I think, you know, um, it's, it really is about uh, the service we deliver to communities, you know, to our stakeholders and RMA and AUMA are our biggest stakeholders. So, you know, we just need to ensure that we're working as, 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 close as, as closely as possible as we can with our communities, that we've got really good, strong relationships and, uh, and support from our communities. And, and, and uh, you know, it is about building that trust and confidence confidence that is so, so critical to delivering a successful uh, police service to communities. Uh, really, it's, it's the communities, it's you folks that have the voice at the end of the day 
as to you know what happens with the RCMP or what doesn't happen. Uh, from Karina, uh, part of the PwC conversation was cost savings through efficiencies. Examples given were the cost sharing more equipment and purchasing less helicopters, et cetera, et cetera. Reducing canine units is another. How do you see this affecting rural areas, specialized resources, alert, and the many other areas as it appears that these could be less part of their cost savings? Yeah, good question as well. And, you know, I, I haven't heard a lot of detail on how this potential new police service will be delivered. Uh, however, you know, I'm, I, I'm not sure. I don't know how there'll be cost savings in those uh, particular areas. We run very lean right now. And like you heard me say earlier, the use of our air services strictly uh, as we can for, for operational functions. Um, you know, so it's examples like that. I think that are, are important to know. Um, yeah, it'll be, it will be interesting. I'm anxious to, to hear about what's being proposed there as well. Hey, and Justin, if you wanna do one more question uh, and then we'll take a break till five, depending on how much time we have. Thanks. Okay. Uh, there was a whole bunch down at the bottom that I didn't get. So I'm just gonna randomly grab one, a short one. Has the legalization of marijuana helped free up members and caused a reduction in crime? That's a good question as well. You know, and I don't, I don't know that we've seen significant gains in that context. You know, um, our, uh, our members on the road and our front lines continue to seize large quantities of cannabis marijuana uh, across the province. Um, and this is illicit cannabis marijuana. So I, I sometimes question um, whether it's actually reduced, uh, reduced the, the black market on marijuana. Okay, and then just one final, final statement here from Ryan. Uh, not a question, but I just want to express that we as Albertans are behind the RCMP and its members. So kudos to, kudos yeah, to you. Thank you. Thank you for that, Ryan, and, and uh, thank you all for the very good questions. Uh, as the minister indicated at the end of his session, I'd be happy to, uh, to engage on the remainder of the questions and provide responses. It, it, it's really crucial. It's important that, that, uh, that you know, accurate information is provided, that you understand as much uh, about your provincial police service as you can. And, and really, that's, you know, those are some of the reasons why we've invited representatives from AOMA and RMA to our division executive committee meetings to, to sit with us to hear about, you know, uh, the business plans and cases that we consider to hear about the initiatives that we're moving forward and, and to participate in, in, uh, in that venue, because it really is about, uh, you know, articulating and, and telling, um, telling the story about the provincial police service and how that's, how that's being provided. Well, thank you so very much again. Uh, we really appreciate your time. We'll be sure to get these questions off to you and because uh, there's still quite a few that have not been answered. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. And thank I guess you, you're welcome. And so we'll be taking, a, was it a five minute break, 10 minute break? Uh, yeah, sorry. Sorry everyone, just a five minute break um, till five o'clock. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you so much.
We're ready to start back. So as everybody finds their way back to their computer screen, we're going to kick off the next part of the session with some fun trivia again. All right. Awesome. So if everybody's back and ready, I will start with the next trivia question. In May of 2019, a man robbed the Onaway Hotel bar during karaoke night. What very Canadian thing did he do? A, yelled, drop it and give me all your money. A, B, brought a round of Timbits for the staff and patrons. C, apologized as he was leaving. And D, sang a Brian Adams summer of 69 before it leaving. All right, we'll give everybody a few minutes to answer the question. All right, as we're waiting for the answer to come up, it was C, apologized as he was leaving. The robber was very polite. Before starting the holdup, he also waited for a patron to finish a song by the chicks. <laughs> All right, on to the next question. Again, in 2016, a female suspect in a break and enter in Prince George tried to make her get away by A, jumping on an ice floe, B, jumping on the back of an unsuspecting moose, C, throwing away in the back of a Canada Post van, or D, stealing and riding away on a Canadian tire bike. We'll give everybody a few, uh, few seconds to answer the question.
All right, just as those last few. Answer was A, jumping on an ice floe. According to Global News, police used a tracking dog to locate the woman on an ice floe in the Nichiko River. Despite the fact she had started a fire on the ice, police say she was taken into custody without incident. All right, we are on to our next speaker. I will hand the floor over to Mike. Well, thank you, Kara, and hello, everyone. I'm Mike Paschik, Mayor for the Summer Village of Half Moon Bay on beautiful Sylvan Lake. And I'm also an AUMA Director representing all 51 summer villages uh, in Alberta. Our last guest speaker today is Brian Sove, President of the National Police Federation. Brian served as an RCMP member for many years in British Columbia. He also uh, was one of the founding members of the National Police Federation, which is now the certified bargaining agent for about 20,000 RCMP members and reservists. Please join me in welcoming Brian to the President's Summit. <clears throat> all seems good. Um, thank you, uh, President, uh, the delegates and all the attendees uh, for having us here today. I think it's a very important conversation that Albertans should have. And, and really from the National Police Federation's perspective, uh, we welcome the uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers transition report, and we've been invited to present and provide information to them. The Premier has actually been fairly open and welcoming to our perspective and our unique perspective on uh, policing transition in Alberta. I'm also going to introduce my colleague, um, Michelle Boutin, who is local to Alberta. Uh, she's one of the Vice Presidents of the National Police Federation. I'll let her uh, do her brief intro, and then we can get started. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Um, zooming in today from the village of Spring Lake, just a little west of Stony Plain. And while it's a beautiful, beautiful place to live, uh, nobody moves here for the Wi-Fi service. So I apologize if it's glitching at all. Uh, the sun is shining, so it should be better today than it has been over the past couple of weeks. Uh, as Brian mentioned, I'm a vice president with the National Police Federation. I'm also a staff sergeant with the RCMP and I'm coming up on 23 years of service. While I'm originally from Ontario, I joined the RCMP out of Vancouver, British Columbia in 1997, and all of my service has been here in Alberta. I consider Alberta to be my home. My husband is also a staff sergeant with the force. He was born and raised just outside of Drumheller and has also done all of his service here in Alberta. We've been posted throughout the province in a variety of roles and locations and have served large municipal small rural and uh, rural, excuse me, reserve policing environments. While we've been presented many opportunities with the force uh, to move across the country, we choose to stay here in Alberta and raise our family here. My own parents live out here now as they relocated to be closer to us and their grandchildren. I am a mother of three strapping young men, all hockey players. And as I'm sure you can appreciate, I have a lot of broken things in my house. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with all of you today. We're very excited to be part of this discussion. Thanks, Michelle. Um, I forgot to mention that uh, I also still have my own connection to Alberta because I spent the entire decade of the 1990s in Alberta. My daughter still lives in Calgary, just uh, in, the, in the Northwest region. So I'm there uh, definitely. This is gonna work, perfect. Um, and, and I, I, I consider myself an adopted Albertan, even though unfortunately I'm not there. I, I love the fact that you don't have a PST. That's just ideal. Um, I realized that there was a backgrounder and, and some documents sent out by, uh, by, by the association to all of you. Uh, I'm not sure with all of your busy schedules if you've had a chance to look at it. Um, a lot of this information that we have in this PowerPoint is contained in there. Uh, we'll also be sharing a hard copy of this with uh, the Secretariat so they can share it with you uh, from that perspective. So to go through this, it gives you a brief overview. You've heard a lot from uh, the Deputy Commissioner Zablocki about the RCMP in Alberta. This will give you a bit of a different lens. 
uh, plus or minus 3,500 members of the RCMP serving in Alberta in different capacities, whether it's provincial, municipal, federal enforcement. Um, as Michelle mentioned, she is not unique, neither is her husband, that the majority of members will spend their entire career, a lot of their career in Alberta. For us, we look at it dealing with the questions of staffing and relocation and trying to get closer to family or closer to home. Alberta is seen along with the Yukon, Northwest Territories and Nova Scotia, kind of like the promised lands of the RCMP. People do what they can to get there. And when they're there, they love to stay. So yes, a lot of our members will leave Olds or Stetler or Hinton after four or five or eight years, but they may just go over to Drumheller or Milk River or Cardston for another four to five years. And it's doubtful that with the provincial policing service you would see anything different um, the ontario provincial police the Sûreté de quebec they do not stay in sioux lookout ontario for their entire careers they transfer down to windsor they go over to london they go up to aurelia so i would expect you would probably see something similar you're not looking at a proposal to create the stetler police service it's the alberta provincial police service which in my opinion is already the RCMP in Alberta. Our membership are extremely heavily engaged in their local communities. As Michelle mentioned, uh, three boys who are hockey players are members. They love hockey, they love sports, they love community engagement. Um, the, you know, whether it's raising money for a food drive or whether it's a volunteer um, initiative or anything to that effect, they are right there engaged in their community, as well as providing a unique policing perspective. One thing with the RCMP you will you will see is that we are probably the most complex and unique police service in the world, um, whether it's urban, rural, provincial, federal, international, specialized police services, we pretty much do it all and have the ability to leverage the experience from members across the country or internationally who can provide that support. Uh, about 90, a little over 95% of the geographic area in Alberta is actually served by the RCMP. Um, and, and we are basically Alberta's Provincial Police Service. So the Fair Deal panel, one thing I wanted to mention about this particular slide is, is uh, you know, the minister spoke about uh, engagement and, and, and the results of that particular Fair Deal panel. Um, the, from our perspective, it was not really representative of the communities that we police in the RCMP. As you'll see from this slide, about 42,000 Albertans were engaged, but the majority of them were from Calgary and Edmonton regions who already have their municipal police service. So if we decided to do our own poll. We went out and we did a Polaris survey in October 2020. You have a lot of that data within your package um, as far as the results of that. The margin of error in this study was plus or minus 2.7%. And the distribution of the respondents you'll see is actually more representative of the communities that the RCMP polices in Calgary suburbs, Edmonton suburbs, rural central, north and south. 1300 residents in total and only 400 or so of those in Calgary and Edmonton proper. The results of that showed that replacing the RCMP consistent with the Fair Deal panel was one of the least helpful measures tested to improve Alberta's place in Canada. In the Fair Deal panel, it came in at 14 out of 15. And as you can see in our survey, it was actually dead last. Further to that, we tested the message as to whether or not residents of Alberta and RCMP police communities actually had confidence in their police service. And 81% of Albertans were satisfied with the service they receive. So you can see 70% of Albertans opposed to replacing the RCMP with an expensive new provincial police service. And when I say expensive, I mean expensive. Um, I have been at the forefront of the transition in Surrey, BC. We can talk further about that or you can ask questions about that and perhaps provide some insight about the challenges that Alberta may face should they go down this road. Costly transition, as mentioned, um, 
uh, through Deputy Commissioner Zablocki's presentation. Uh, the feds pay about 30% for the Alberta Provincial Policing Service. So we're not talking about communities over 5,000 or over 50,000 or 15,000. We're just talking about that provincial portion for communities under 5,000 in population. And that translates right now to about $112.4 million annually. Uh, we're not talking here about specialized policing services either. And when you get into <clears throat> the transition report that PricewaterhouseCoopers is doing, some of the uh, issues that we identified to PricewaterhouseCoopers that a province or a government may want to take into consideration are specialized units. So for example, the ability of the RCMP right now to capitalize on critical mass, whether it be for major crimes, forensics, um, emergency response teams, underwater recovery teams, explosives, explosives disposal units, not to mention major events. And the example I've used is the G8 summit from Kananaskis. Um, should that happen again, would a provincial police service actually have the critical mass needed to provide the security for that? Or would they rely on Calgary, Edmonton, Lethbridge, Medicine Hat? Or would they have to rely on the RCMP to come in and assist? So IT and infrastructure, um, policing services obviously require a fairly secure IT infrastructure when you're dealing with either the dispatching of vehicles, the encryption of radios and such. That is a multi-million dollar um, uh, venture. Us, you know, interesting story from the NPF's perspective when we were creating our growth phase through 2016 to through 2019, we decided to develop an app and that was my first experience to IT and how um, those that are um, adept at IT really control the end user or the developer of that uh, because an update comes every six months and it will cost you thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to keep your app up to date. Uh, IMIT is not uh, an easy question to answer. Uh, pensions and pension portability, what we've seen in the Surrey transition is that <clears throat> the BC Municipal Pension Plan is actually richer than the RCMP Pension Plan for a number of reasons, contribution rates and benefits afterwards. So there's actually quite a shortfall for uh, junior or mid-career members of the RCMP to consider leaving the RCMP and go to the Surrey Police Service. So it becomes a recruiting hurdle for the Surrey Police Service or uh, a cost to the Surrey Police Service should they choose to make up that shortfall and attract those. So in the end, um, replacing RCMP would cost millions, if not um, closing in on nine zeros or more for unknown service levels, uh, further deepening the imbalance of what Alberta contributes to Alberta and what it receives. And really you have to wonder if this is going to improve the um, idea or the ideals behind the fair deal panel, which is to improve Alberta's position in, in, in confederation. Uh, ultimately, so many unknowns with respect to this, um, you know, taxpayers really should be asking hard questions of their government to ensure that the feasibility study and the transition does not come up with um, surprises or hiccups at the last minute. How you can help, from our perspective, we've, we've started a, uh, um, an online campaign for the residents of Alberta, as well as any municipality that wants to get engaged. So first off, you can insist that a review of potential transition be objective, transparent, and thorough. That's the PricewaterhouseCoopers transition report. They should be delving into all things. Some of the, uh, the items that we've identified is smaller postings that don't have a viable real estate market, for example. And I think the example we used, or one of them was uh, Grassy Lake, Alberta. Um, a member of the RCMP who is going to Grassy Lake, Alberta for four years or eight years or seven years may not feel like buying a property in Grassy Lake because either the real estate market may be flat or um, they might experience the possibility for a loss. Uh, we've seen that a lot in Fort McMurray. So does that mean that your community police officer now is going to live 20, 30, 50, 80 kilometers away because 
for their family, it's the best and wisest financial decision to buy outside of Grassy Lake, Alberta. Those are some of the thought processes. Smaller isolated posts, the RCMP currently owns a whole bunch of real estate where members can basically pay rent to operate a for, or to live in a force owned house. So does the government of Alberta look at getting into the real estate market and providing housing for those who may be in less than desirable postings? So two is to get involved and ultimately ensure that the full cycle costs and community safety impacts of a transition be considered. What we've seen in Surrey is a challenge with recruiting <clears throat> whether or not the membership of the RCMP is interested in moving over to a Surrey police service, those that don't, there is still a shortfall of positions to be filled. And where are they going to come from? So it's no secret that the policing community is having a challenge. As, as I like to say, kids today, they're not growing up running around in the backyard playing cops and robbers we don't do a good job as chiefs of police or as unions or as police officers in advocating for our profession today we need to do better all of all stripes across the board all badges um, so how do we do better and until we can do better the number of applicants for police services across canada is not going to be big enough to meet the demand, whether it's the OPP, Toronto, Vancouver, my colleagues at the Canadian Police Association, they all say the same thing, that they have trouble filling their recruit classes. That's a challenge that we face. So if we have that challenge and we know of that challenge, creating a police service of 3000 plus members in Alberta will become a challenge. If you cannot get a sufficient percentage to come over from the RCMP, where do the rest come from? Are we going to look at poaching from Calgary or Edmonton or Lethbridge Medicine Hat or Regina or Vancouver? Are we looking at in substantial numbers impacting the safety of those communities? Because now Calgary, Edmonton, Lethbridge Medicine Hat, Regina and Vancouver will all have vacancies and they will have challenges filling their positions. So that's what we've seen in Surrey is that it looks as though the Surrey Police Service will destabilize community safety in the entire Lower Mainland just because of trying to find 800 to 850 new police officers kind of overnight. The last thing is uh, you can visit our webpage. We keep some updates on there. Keep albertarcmp.ca or if you're on social media and Facebook, feel free to uh, follow us at Keep Alberta RCMP. And obviously we'd appreciate that you share the information with other residents in Alberta so that we can have an engaging, thoughtful and, um, and um, uh, informative conversation. So subject to that, there's uh, any questions? Well, thank you, uh, Brian and Michelle. We do have some time for questions and uh, we've got a, a few of them in the queue. So I'll just uh, read them out for you and we'll get your thoughts on them. Uh, one comment I'll make uh, uh, just before we get to the questions, if you've been following the chat box uh, throughout the other presentations, you'll see that uh, many, many of the attendees today agree with your findings uh, about um, the fair deal panel recommendation for a provincial uh, police force being the le least helpful uh, suggestion in their uh, work. Um, here's the first one from Richard. Uh, what other services belong to your organization? We are only the one. We, uh, 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 the National Police Federation only represents members of the RCMP and only the membership below the rank of inspector. And, and some have asked, well, why are you engaged in this? Why are you doing that? And, and, and I say, well, A, we're a relatively new organization. Uh, we were certified in July 2019. Um, we've just finished our first complete year of operations and, and 148 years almost where the RCMP membership, those that are working in Coaldale or working in um, um, uh, Blairmore, uh, you can see I spent a lot of time in Southern Alberta, 
I know all the towns down there, um, have never had the opportunity to have an independent voice that speaks on their behalf. So the NPF has been around now. We're starting to be that voice and, and speak about all of the good work that they do. So quick answer to the question is just members of the RCMP uh, and just operational police officers. Oh, very good, thank you. Uh, next one up from uh, Karina. Um, she's wondering if you'll be sharing the results of your polling uh, with the government, uh, with PWC. Uh, she feels that the important results that you got uh, were not obtained in the work that uh, PWC did. Good question. And yes, actually, we have already shared that polling data with the minister's office, with um, the premier's office, as well as PricewaterhouseCoopers and their team. So. Very good, thank you. Uh, Marianne is uh, curious if uh, your organization has completed a survey with your current members uh, to get a sense for how they feel about what the government of Alberta is doing and in looking at a provincial police force? Interesting question. Yes and no. So no, we have not done an internal survey with the membership of the National Police Federation uh, to gauge what their thoughts are with respect to the province. We do, however, um, obviously monitor and get inquiries from members directly. Um, you know, I look at the national perspective where they'll email the NPF national boxes and we get their perspective, their thoughts. Michelle is actually on the ground in Edmonton, as well as her colleagues, Jeff and Kevin. So she could speak to the people that she interacts with on a regular daily basis. Sure, happy to do so. Um, great question. Um, the feedback that I'm hearing is that they're disappointed in this government's uh, decision to, to take a look at replacing the RCMP. As we've discussed, most members that work here, live here, uh, have family and friends here. They're Albertans. Uh, they love serving the communities that they work and that they live in, and they're disappointed. 2020 hasn't been an easy year uh, for those in policing, in particular with the RCMP. It's been challenging, and those RCMP members still show up every day to serve Canadians, uh, and they do so with pride in the communities they serve, and that's not outside of uh, Surrey or Alberta. Um, so I think they're disappointed. I think that they, uh, they expected more. And, and, you know, that, uh, that comes through in the uh, conversation in the chat box throughout uh, today's uh, presentation, where those folks that are attending uh, this webinar here are concerned for your members' uh, mental health with uh, something like this going on and in a, a difficult uh, period of time. So, uh, uh, you know, we can certainly uh, uh, empathize with uh, your members uh, out there. And I do wonder, I do wonder, uh, though, if, as you, if, if it did go ahead, and you were talking about people transferring uh, across, you know, if people, if your members are uh, deeply tied to Alberta, uh, would many of those members take the opportunity to transfer across to a provincial police force? Uh, I'll let Brian answer some of that as well, but um, I can speak for the majority of, of those that have, have discussed this, that situation or that opportunity with me. Um, they would not, uh, given that there's a great sense of pride um, in RCMP members and, and belonging to uh, the National Police Force. There's also um, pension to consider and those types of things. Brian has some numbers with regards to that and, and what we would see by way of service of the members and who may uh, consider it as an option. Would we have some that would consider it? Absolutely. Um, but I don't think it's going to be the numbers that are anywhere near uh, what they need. And I think the vast majority would, uh, would consider staying with the RCMP. 
And sorry to um, interrupt, we're just going to bring the questions to a close. Uh, but I think, Brian, you had mentioned you and Michelle are happy to take back the ones that are outstanding and get us some written responses. We Perfect. certainly can, yes. Okay, uh, great. So it, anything that's um, outstanding, we'll, we'll, we'll get over to Brian and we'll share it with everyone. Uh, and yeah, Mike, I'll just let you um, <laughs> close out here. Well, I'll, I'll close out and, and thank you both, uh, Brian and Michelle, for being here today and for bringing the information forward to all those attending today. And now we'll move on to some more trivia with Kara. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so everybody has got their fingers ready to uh, vote on the next trivia question. So under the topic of historic crimes, the next trivia question is what crime or crimes led to the establishment of a federal police force in 1873? A, the crime spree of the wild McLean boys in Kamloops, BC, stealing horses, ammunition, and liquor. B, a wave of cattle rustling that swept the prairies. C, the massacre of a band of Assiniboid people in the Cypress Hills of present-day Southern Saskatchewan. Or D, Prolific train robber Bill Milner's repeated thefts between Mission and Maple Ridge, BC. So I'll just give everybody a few seconds to answer the question or pick what they think. All right. As those answers are slowly coming in, the answer is C. The Massacre of a Cinnaboid Band. According to CanadaHistories.ca, a group of Montana hunters and whiskey traders was responsible for the massacre. Prior to the establishment of the federal force, enforcement in the West was mostly left to officers at the Hudson's Bay Company for a trading fort. Okay, on to the next trivia question. Only two trains have ever been robbed in Canada. Both fell victim to Bill Milner in B.C., his first holdup of a CPR engine in 1904 netted him $10,000 in gold and bonds. His second robbery of the CPR Transcontinental Express, also in BC, landed him a $1,000 in bonds and 10 pounds of smoked salmon, B, $15 in liver pills, C, $25 and 10 beaver pelts, or D, $15,000 and one pound of opium. I'll give everybody a few seconds to get their answer in. All right. The answer is B, $15 and some liver pills. This haul cost him his freedom. He was arrested and sentenced to life in prison, but soon escaped. All right, we are on to the next part of our session today. I will hand the floor over to Paul and Barry as they will take you through the last part of the session. Thanks, Kara. Um, I have to say, I've been watching the chat and uh... I'm glad you're all my friends. Uh, I don't want to be on the bad side of any of you folks. You're amazing. You got great ideas. Appreciate your passion on this topic. And uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to talk a little bit about uh, jurisdictional review. So we're on the last item, and uh, the AUMA and RMA have fantastic staff. And these folks have put together some research on the provincial police services in both Ontario and Quebec. We looked at how these services are built, as well as the cost of policing for municipalities of various sizes in these provinces. So we'll share the results of that research with you. We've also considered the experience of municipalities that looked into transitioning away from using the RCMP. Based on what we've learned, we'll go over what we think are the key considerations for Alberta municipalities with respect to a provincial police force in Alberta. Finally, after throwing nearly three hours of information at you folks, we'll end today's session with a survey to gather your feedback. Both AUMA and RMA will use the results of this survey to inform our future advocacy and actions on this project. Ontario Police Force Billing Model. First, let's look at Ontario. The OPP was established in 1909, but was given the, the mandate to serve as a provincial police force and not until the 1940s. 
In Ontario, policing arrangements are as fo follows. Municipalities may set up their own police service, arrange with one or more municipalities to have a regional police service for the area, hire the police service of another municipality, or hire the OPP or Ontario Provincial Police Force. For all police policing arrangements, municipalities pay 100% of their policing costs. Note that the government of Ontario does not provide ongoing subsidies or discounts for policing costs in municipalities served by the OPP. Although municipalities may be eligible to apply for specific one-time public safety grants or programs. The billing model for contracting the OPP was reviewed in 2014 and a new model was implemented in 2015. This model divides the majority of municipal policing costs into two categories, base service and calls for service model. The base service activities include proactive policing, crime prevention, administrative duties, patrol, and training. The total cost providing base service is calculated based on the number of officers required. This cost is then allocated among municipalities on an equal per property basis. The province also calculates the total costs of calls for service. The calls for service costs are then allocated to municipalities based on their individual usage. Municipalities are also billed for their specific use of overtime, cleaning caretaking, court security, prison transport, accommodations, and enhancements. Now this slide in front of you folks shows the total cost of municipal policing for the OPP in 2019 and 2020, broken out into base service, calls for service, and other costs. In 2019, this cost was over $409 million. To put the numbers in context for the OPP, municipal policing cost is about 35% of the overall OPP budget. This figure is from 2016, when municipal policing costs were slightly lower at $395 million. So moving on to Quebec. The Sarrette de Quebec was formed in 1870 and became the provincial police force in 1930. In Quebec, municipalities with populations under 50,000 may set up their own police service, Hire Sarrette de Quebec, the SQ. These municipalities pay 100% of policing costs for their own municipal police service, but only 50% of policing costs if they hire the SQ. Municipalities that are part of metropolitan areas, as well as municipalities with populations of 50,000, must set up their own police service and pay 100% of the costs. Unlike Ontario, there is no link between municipal billing and the service levels provided by the SQ. The formula for billing municipalities is outlined in a regulation under the Quebec Police Act. The formula takes the following factors into account. Changes in the consumer price index, the number of police officers assigned to the municipality or region, and the municipality's standardized property value. Now this is looking at the Alberta police model today. And this is what the model currently looks like. And the province provides grants to all municipalities that are required to provide their own policing to help, to help offset policing costs. The federal government also covers a portion of the policing costs, and we've heard that today. For all municipalities that are served by the RCMP, 10% for municipalities with populations over 15,000, and 30% for municipalities with populations up to 15,000. For urban municipalities with a population of 5,000 and under, Historically, the provincial government has paid 70% of the policing costs and the federal government has paid 30%. However, as I'm sure you know, the new regulation under the Police Act came into effect last year and these municipalities, as well as all municipal districts and counties, are now required to pay a portion of their policing costs. Now in front of you is a snapshot of the current provincial police services in Ontario, Quebec and Alberta as a comparison. And I have to caution you, this is a high level comparison. So we're not really comparing apples to apples. The OPP, SQ and K division do not provide exactly the same services in exactly the same way, nor do they have the same numbers of police officers per capita. Geez, does that sound like the MMI to you? Anyways, 
Um, there are also population and geographical con considerations that are difficult to account for in just dollars and cents. We are not looking closely at a comparison of service levels and local input and policing costs across the jurisdictions, which are important factors to provide context to these cost, cost differences. And the, adual, the annual budget for the RCMP K division is not yet available. Curtis talked a little bit about it earlier, but in any case, it would, would include the costs for federal policing portfolio, while the OPP and the SQ do not, uh, do, not, do not have federal policing. So please bear all these caveats in mind when we start to compare these. And this is the snapshot of the OPP policing costs. We want to give you an idea of what municipalities of various sizes are currently paying for police services they receive from the provincial police service. And I got to caution you, these are high level snapshots. So um, it's different to look at service uh, levels and, and local input, but just these numbers at least give you some a view. Provincial levels and standard levels of services are different as are geographies, populations, crime rates, and policing priorities on a local uh, regional basis. And municipal policing does reflect how, doesn't reflect how policing is, is funded on a provincial level as well. Now this table shows 2019 policing costs for municipalities that are policed by the OPP. In Ontario, per capita costs of smaller municipalities tend to be higher, which primarily re reflects how municipalities in Ontario are billed for cost recovery of policing. Smaller municipalities do not receive any provincial or federal subsidies, and the more remote they are from larger centers, the less likely they are to realize the economies of scale that larger municipalities do. And also because Ontario ties billing to levels of service, and Ontario, like Alberta, has experienced high rural crime rates, this may be reflected in the higher costs for smaller municipalities. And in Quebec, this is a snapshot of the SQ policing costs. You'll note that the per capita costs are a bit more consistent across the municipalities. This likely reflects the fact that billing is not tied to service use. Also, policing, policing costs per capita tend to be lower than what you see in Ontario and Alberta. This is because the government of Quebec only charges 50% of the policing costs of municipalities with populations under 50,000 that are policed by the SQ. And finally, these are examples of the costs for municipalities of various sizes in Alberta. Note that we use the 2020 policing costs for the smaller municipalities to capture costs under the new funding model that was implemented last year. Policing costs for municipalities and municipal districts and counties with populations under 5,000 in Alberta tend to be much lower than in Ontario and Quebec. This primarily reflects the difference in police funding models. In Ontario, these municipalities pay the full cost of policing. In Quebec, they pay 50% of the actual cost of, of, of policing. In Alberta last year, they pay, as, as of now, 10% of the actual cost of policing. However, for larger municipalities in Alberta, the costs are closer to what is currently be, be, being paid in both Ontario and Quebec. What these comparisons don't include are the different, different levels of services, responsiveness, and local impact to policing in small and rural municipalities compared to larger towns and cities. The Alberta Police Interim Advisory Board recently conducted a member survey indicating that rural municipalities, villages and summer villages, prioritize the need for improved response times much more than larger municipalities that are they're more likely to host a detachment. The survey also shows that municipalities with a population below 20, 2,000 sorry, had lower levels of engagement and input into local policing priorities than other municipalities. The point here is that while capital costs allow for a partial comparison of policing, both within and across Alberta, a full comparison of policing effectiveness would require linking costs to service levels and input. Now I'll pass it on to Barry. All right, thanks, Paul. Um, it has been an amazing uh, afternoon and evening and it has been long, so we're gonna get through this last part. Um, so we have looked at now, just looked at other provincial policing models. We're gonna shift gears and talk about some recent municipal experiences um, that have considered a shift away from the RCMP. So uh, over the last 10 years, there's been three municipalities that have looked at a move to an independent police service uh, Richmond and Surrey and BC's Lower Mainland and the city of Red Deer. So let's start with Richmond. So in 2013, Richmond undertook a review to ensure its police service was meeting local needs and priorities. And there were concerns that the RCP did not reflect the diversity and that the RCMP continued to struggle to provide the budgeted number of police officers to Richmond. 
Um, in particular, council requested the study due uh, to concerns they had identified in areas of governance, local needs, cost controls, and service delivery. So from a financial perspective, the review found that a transition away from the RCMP would require implementation costs of roughly 20 million, as well as long-term uh, increases of between five and 9%. So the total tax implication there would be between one and two. And the review actually found that Richmond paid less per capita for RCMP services than comparable cities in the lower mainland, and that uh, their current per officer cost for an RCMP officer was roughly 5% lower than the cost of an officer for an average independent police force. Now, from a governance perspective, the review indicated that local input into policing would be greatly enhanced. They would have positive impacts on setting service levels to respond to local needs, enhancing police accountability to the community, hiring and retaining employees familiar with the community, as well as other benefits. Now, although the governance and service level input would be a major improvement, the community would lose a great deal of capacity, efficiencies and expertise that were provided by the RCMP. So not only would many of RCMP's specialized and national resources be much more difficult to access, but more staff would likely be required as human resources, IT and other functions previously provided on a regional or national basis by the RCMP would have to be provided locally. So as part of the review process, Richmond surveyed residents for their thoughts on a police service shift. And despite the community concerns about the RCMP reflecting the Richmond community being a driver for the reviews, only 29% of the response, sorry, respondents ultimately supported a shift to an independent model. Ultimately, Richmond elected to maintain its relationship with the RCMP, along with the direction for the city to work with a local detachment to enhance service levels including the possibility of forming a police board in Richmond to improve local input. So the city of Red Deer also undertook a similar review uh, like Richmond in 2018, and the review compared RCMP and municipal police delivery in three areas, governance and oversight, operating and capital costs, and operations management. Now, from a financial perspective, the review found that the projected operating costs would increase by about 17%, and transition costs would sit at over $13 million. Now the governance and service level findings of the Red Deer Review were also very similar to Richmond. On the plus side, an independent police service would increase local input into policing as it would allow Red Deer to form a police commission under the Police Act. However, with that increased control came increased risk and liability for the city, something that is not often considered when the two models are compared. And while an independent model could better reflect changing local needs and priorities, much of the RCMP's expertise and capacity would be lost. During the review, Red Deer surveyed their residents with 92% indicating they were satisfied or very satisfied with the current RCMP service. Based on this, and after evaluating the cost, local input, and service level trade-offs of the two options, Red Deer decided to maintain the RCMP service. Our last municipal example is Surrey, and unlike Richmond and Red, uh, and Red Deer, Surrey bypassed the study process led by a newly elected mayor and decided to begin the transition away from the RCMP service in 2018. Prior to their, their transition, Surrey was the largest city in Canada still receiving police services from the RCMP, and the transition process is the largest and most complex in Canadian history. The decision to move away from the RCMP was based on similar reasoning to what prompted the studies in the previous examples. Surrey Council identified the following benefits of a transition, officers that were more connected to the community, an increase in community focus, improved oversight of policing, and increased accountability. Uh, the table in front of you shows RCMP staffing levels for Surrey compared to proposed staffing levels under the municipal service. According to the city's transition report, although staffing numbers are quite similar, how officers are used in the community will change to become more responsive. For example, uh, Surrey PD will deploy 16% more frontline officers and will utilize a tiered policing model in which community safety officers take on lower priority, lower risk, and lower complexity cases, thus freeing up officer capacity. Now, while the survey, uh, sorry, while the Surrey PD approach sounds good in theory, the 
the transition process has been plagued by controversies and ballooning costs. The force was originally expected to be operational this April, but that will not take place until 2022. The implementation costs, which were originally estimated at 45 million, have increased to 63.7 million, mainly due to the complexity of creating an IT system to replace what was previously provided for by the RCMP. In addition, uh, Surrey is still lacking detailed cost estimates on a number of less visible, but certainly critically important operational components, including officer training, legal costs, and others. To account for the escalation, sorry, escalating costs of the transition. Uh, Surrey is applying a $200 levy to each household in 2021 and increasing property taxes by 2.9%. So while it's important to keep in mind that replacing the RCMP with an independent police service in a single municipality is nowhere close as to as complicated as creating a provincial wide police force would be, there are still some lessons to be learned from the experiences of these three cities. First and foremost, it's clearly stated that creating a police force is complex and costly. Not only do the obvious issues like service levels have to be figured out, but everything from IT to compensation to liability has to be understood and addressed properly. Any disruptions that impact police services during or after the transition can impact the health and safety of any, any or all residents, so it cannot be treated simply as a learning process. Despite the costs and complexity, if done right though, an independent police force can have major advantages, especially in areas such as local input, flexibility and adaptability, and ensuring police service reflects the needs and diversity of the community it serves. And those were areas identified as positives and areas that they needed improvement in on all the municipal forces that were studied. What we saw in Surrey's situation is that trudges and costs were underestimated. Although Richmond and Red Deer did not reach a point where they began to transition, both of their studies acknowledged that their transition costs were es just estimates and that the actual cost of the shift would not be known until the process began. Now, this is also very important to consider as moving forward at a provincial level, just because of the massive scale of Alberta would make accurate estimates even more difficult. Now, in general, you can have it all with an independent police force if you're willing to pay for it. And certainly municipalities know the value for money proposition. We do that all the time. Now, all three reviews indicated that local input would be enhanced, but that would it be difficult to maintain service levels and replace the RCMP's capacity and specialized services without paying significantly more. This begs the question, what good is more input into a service that cannot meet the demands of a community without significant cost increases? This is an important balance that will have to be considered moving forward provincially. And the last lesson learned is that policing and public safety is a political issue, but also a very serious issue. Policing is so complex that ideas that may sound good when discussed at a high level begin to look very different when more information is provided. This was the case in Surrey where council based a decision off general public concern about RCMP responsiveness, but have now faced major public backlash to the transition process as more information of the cost and complexity has come out. Now, this is not to say that moving away from the RCMP is necessarily impossible or a bad idea, but only to say that oversimplifying the process is extremely risky, particularly for our communities and any transition should proceed cautiously, allow plenty of time for research engagement and prepared to pivot from an original plan. Now, even more so, the access to information is really important. And to that end, AUB and RMA have asked the province to make sure they disclose all the information that's going into the study of this. Now let's wrap up some general considerations. The first is that there's simply no blueprint for what Alberta Provincial Police Force would look like. It has not been done at the provincial level in modern history. So while it's fine to consider aspects of Ontario and Quebec and Richmond, Red Deer and Surrey, none of them really have the answers for Alberta because the province has to decide on a lot of things and the provincial approach is certainly significantly more complicated. The next area that municipalities need to consider is how are they willing to balance the assumed increased input that would come from a provincial police, sorry, come from a provincial police force 
with the increased costs that seem obvious to us at this point? And where do you as municipalities draw that line? If you had a stronger partnership with your local detachment, would you be willing to pay more? Another consideration is with, will a provincial police force actually improve service levels and responsiveness? We see in Ontario and Quebec that although policing decisions are made in provincial capitals, the local relationship between municipal and detachments does not appear much different than what currently exists here. How will a police service managed out of Edmonton, for instance, be more responsive to the needs of Mackenzie County, Claire's Home, or Wainwright? It might, but there are certainly no guarantees at, the point, at this point and many questions to be answered. On a related note, we need to ask ourselves what we can borrow from other jurisdictions to improve policing in Alberta, regardless of whether it is through the RCMP or, or a provincial service. And that's something we don't have to wait for. We can do that now. So what works elsewhere? What doesn't? Based on all that we've heard tonight, it's hard to know whether the RCMP model actually requires an overhaul or whether the calls for a provincial police service are, are based on the politics of the situation we're in. How do we know whether the cost and complexity of a new model is justified? What is the threshold to know that the province has made the right decision? And finally, what questions are still outstanding that require answers from the government? When the PwC report is released, we will know more about the next steps and we will expect all of the information about costs and other details. It's important for municipalities to be prepared to seek answers from their MLAs on how a new model would impact local policing. And it's really important for all of the membership, uh, both in AUMA and RMA, to remain vigilant and engaged. And I wanna really say to all of you that are here today, and I know this message is gonna reverberate throughout your communities, how proud I am of the engagement on this issue because it is a huge community issue. Now with that, we're gonna to go to Bruce who's gonna wrap us up with a few polling questions and uh, our time together is almost at an end. So Bruce, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Barry. I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, yeah, my name is Bruce McLeod. I'm the mayor of the village of Acme and uh, I'm also AUMA director for Village of South. Okay, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna ask a few questions uh, and we really want to hear from you. Give us your honor, honest answers uh, to the specific questions. So let's move on to the first question, please. Okay, what is the most important considerations for your municipality with respect to policing? Costs, level of service, oversight, ability to influence local policing priorities, A, B, and C are all equal. Do, 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 do. Sorry, I got no music. Oh, somebody else has got music. <laughs> and the answer is A, B, C, A, B, and C are all equally important. Great. Okay, let's move on to the next one. My municipality would be willing to pay more for policing if it means we have we will have better service and improved oversight. Strongly agree, agree, neither agree nor disagree, disagree, strongly disagree. Answer now, please. Agreed. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Next, we'll move on. When considering operating costs, I believe that an independent provincial police service could better meet my uh, community's needs than the current RCMP policing model. Strongly agree, agree, neither agree nor disagree, disagree, strongly disagree. Answer now, please. And the answer. 
answers? Ooh, strongly disagree. Okay, moving on. When considering uh, serv service levels, I believe that an independent provincial police service could better meet my community needs than the current RCMP policy uh, policing model. Sorry, strongly agree, agree, neither agree or disagree, disagree or strongly disagree. Answers? Strongly disagree. Okay, only a few more. So the next one. When considering oversight and ability to influence local policing priorities, I believe that an independent police, uh, provincial police service could better meet my community's needs than the current RCMP pol uh, policing model. Strongly agree. Agree, neither agree nor disagree, disagree, strongly disagree. And the answer is strongly disagree. Okay, interesting again. So we'll move on. Based on what I have learned today, I believe that the best policing model for my community would be an independent Alberta police, provincial police service, the current RCMP policing model, an RCMP policing model with improvements to oversight and service levels, undecided. Answer now, please. And the answer is interesting. Okay, thank you. Moving on. My council has enough information to decide whether we support or oppose establishing a provincial police service. Strongly agree, agree, neither agree nor disagree. Disagree, strongly agree, strongly disagree, sorry. And the answer, well, that's kind of agree, disagree, hmm, interesting. Okay, so if you answer disagree or strongly disagree to the previous question, please select what additional information your council would need to make a decision. Decision. You may select multiple responses on this question, please. I should have read that, but you guys are faster readers than I am. Okay, and the answers, other, okay. Okay, all right. If you, um, if you answered other as one of the responses to uh, the previous question, please use the chat box to enter what type of information you believe is miss, uh, missing from the list. By the way, great job, everybody. Thank you for being on uh, for this long a period of time. 
Thanks for your feedback. Now or, over to Kara for the last trivia question and the gift basket draw. Back to you. Thank you so much, Bruce. On to our last few trivia questions. The second last question is, the old Ottawa jail is famous for among other things being the site of the hanging of Patrick Whalen on February 11th, 1869 for the assassination of a member of parliament and father of confederation, Thomas Darcy McGee. Upon closing in 1972, the jail was converted to A, a hostel, B, a museum, C, a gallery, or D, a distillery. We'll give everybody a few seconds to answer the question. The answer is A, looking for a quaint romantic, romantic getaway, the hostel is allegedly haunted by a Whalen spirit, which will appear at the end of the guest beds or in his death row cell. On to our last question. Blaming the Department of Social Services for his problems, distraught gunman Robert Crawford roamed the Alberta legislature grounds trying to provoke a shootout with police on October 14th of what year? A, 1968, B, 1978, C, 1988, or D, 1998? <laughs> The answer is C, 1988. Crawford was eventually shot but not killed by police and later sentenced to four years in prison for his actions. This was the second shooting at the Alberta legislature. A man previously committed murder-suicide in 1977. Well, that wraps up our trivia for today. Now the moment you've all been waiting for, the gift bas basket draw. And the basket winner is Mayor Greg from the town of Bonacord. Congratulations, Greg. I will now hand the floor back to Barry, or to Barry and Paul for closing comments. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, Kara. And I, I don't wanna keep you folks away from supper, so I'll just wait, make uh, one final word. First of all, I have to commend all you folks, fantastic ideas. I would rather have spent the last three hours talking about the root cause of crime, which is poverty, housing, uh, substance abuse, mental health, the justice system. And I'd rather spend all this time talking about how to make uh, RCMP better and more accountable to our communities. Instead, we're talking about provincial police force. But you folks came up with some fantastic details. Thank you so much for your effort. Thanks to the AUMA and RMA staff for putting this together and making us look good. And uh, appreciate all that you folks do. Keep doing what you're doing. Thanks for advocating on behalf of your communities. And uh, we hope that we'll come on the right side of this and have safer communities in both rural and urban Alberta and, uh, and make this a safe place to live. So thank you very much. And Paul, thank you and the RMA for participating together with us. I think when we're together, I think on issues that have so much to do with our communities, we have much more impact. So thank you for that. I wanna thank all our guest speakers for their presentations. Um, we appreciate we, that we have a good working relationship with Justice and the Solicitor General the RCMP and the National Police Federation because getting uh, good information is really important to make good decisions. And that'll make us stronger and more legitimate advocates for our communities. So I wanna say thank you very much. You all have a great night and uh, continue to be engaged on this issue.